What's up guys? It's yo boy Oma Sensei. Welcome to Reborn a Soccer with A Gamer Interface. Part 3. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story. Link in the description. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. Katara looked at the figure in the mist, and she felt something familiar about it. But as the mist around them cleared out, the man wasn't someone she had ever met before. He has strikingly silver white hair, red eyes, and an emotionless face. The demeanor of the man seemed like that of a warrior, as he wore clothes that were fit for a warrior, and his blue armor showed that he might be from the Northern Water tribe. The man looked at Arn and Katara, his stare was so fierce that it made them nervous. Did you do this? His simple question was all both of them needed to know that he knew they were the ones who had caused the dam to break. Arn looked down in shame. Yes, he admitted his mistakes. We were fooled by someone who we thought might be our friend. Nothing in the world is more dangerous than sincere ignorance and conscientious stupidity, said the man emotionlessly. But it was clear that he was angry. Using waterbending to destroy innocent villages. Learn who is your enemy. Don't act out of ignorance without knowing what you are doing. Katara's gaze also fell, knowing that what she had done would have killed hundreds of people if the man hadn't been here to stop it. She had nothing to say and couldn't help but think of her brother's words and what he had said when they told him what they were doing. Do not be stupid. Ash, those were the words he had said. She had preached that they knew what they were doing. But sadly that isn't it. The man's red eyes were terrifying as he looked at them. But the atmosphere was broken when Sokka, breathing heavily, appeared. He looked at Arn and Katara, waving at them. Hey there, are you guys okay? Neither of them answered too endorsed in the consequences that their reckless actions could have caused. But Sokka glanced at the man with a knowing smile and waved at him too. Hey Master Toborama, so you met my sister that I was talking about. Arn was surprised and came out of his stupor. Sokka, you know him. Yeah, he is Toborama, a master waterbender that agreed to teach you. Yeah. That's not happening, added Toborama, causing Sokka to look at him with a cringing face, like he had swallowed a whole lemon. But the man was insistent. I am not going to teach people that are irresponsible enough with their bending, that they almost killed an entire village full of innocent people. There were even children in there. What if I wasn't around? Sokka winced. Hey, come on, can't you give them another chance? No, the man answered simply and started walking off. A mist surrounded him, which obscured everyone's view and then he disappeared. Only a puddle was left on the ground. This caused Sokka to sigh. Damn it, I went through so much to have that guy even consider teaching you. Sorry, Arn apologized. But this caused Sokka to shake his head. No, no, there is no need to apologize. Just make sure that you don't do something like this again. Also, tell me when you are doing things like this. When you said you were helping the rebel group, I thought it was just to drive off some Fire Nation soldiers and not fill a dam. Ash Sokka POV I could see it in their eyes that both Katara and Arn were sorry and apologetic about what they had done. Which was at least a step forward. Also having my water clone transform into Toborama and then have mist around it while I dispelled it would make him appear more mystifying. This had been all carefully planned to make a picture where Arn and Katara would learn from it. Using Toborama as my transformation target was to play his character. People instinctively judged what kind of person someone was within the 10 seconds of their appearance. So I had to make him imposing and seem like a figure of authority, while at the same time expressing himself as a master waterbender. Quest completed. Defend the village rewards. 10,000 experience points demonic illusion. Hell viewing technique I looked at the last notification and mentally selected it. Demonic illusion. Hell viewing technique level 1 a week. D rank Jinjutsu. Can be used to show their target's worst fears. Can easily be broken through. As expected. My gamer interface changed as soon as I made contact with Chakra. Now it was offering Naruto world rewards too. But what made me curious was how Jinjutsu worked in this world. It would either be unbreakable by the normal people or less. No one other than me had Chakra in this world. So that made it unbreakable, because one needed to use chakra to break through a Jinjutsu. But at the same time, a Jinjutsu was something that was attached to a person's chakra network, that was how it was used. This was also how Sense and Ninja like Karen were able to tell when someone was under an illusion. Still, I will have to test this later and see if Jinjutsu was effective to the people of this world. While it was a shame, the latter was probably the most likely scenario here. Meaning that Jinjutsu was mostly useless in this world. And I wasn't willing to have chakra networks built into others, just so Jinjutsu could be used on them. Because that would mean that they will be able to use Jutsu too. Looking at Katara, I went and put my arm around her, bringing her closer to my chest. Don't worry little sis, as long as you don't make the same mistake. Things like this can't happen anymore. We will save many people, so don't get discouraged so early. She nodded, mushing her face on my chest as I sighed. This is quite hypocritical of me, 
but right now I will be the brother she needs to lean on. A couple of hours later, in the forest outside of the village that had almost been destroyed, I looked at my water clone and wondered if this was the best decision. Well, only the future will tell. The best I could do now was make the decision I thought about carefully. I was leaving Avatar's group, of course, not without precaution, as a water clone would stay with them, and I had control of it. Also, Kiwi, Appa, Ahn, and Katara were friendly characters I had tagged in my map which meant that I would always know their general locations. Continuing to stay with them would be the safer choice for me, but not the best one. I needed to experience explosive growth, and I was nowhere near where I had to be power-wise. The story in Avatar is quite rapid, and before I know it Sozin's Comet will come around. This war must come to an end before that. Trusting a 12 years old kid like Ahn to save me was naive and borderline stupid. Instead, from now on, I had to take things into my own hands. So with that in mind, my water clone smiled like I always would and gave me a thumbs up while walking away. With a sigh, I turned around and called onto empty air. Evil lady, I need you for something. The space next to me twisted, and she appeared. Her grey skin was pale as ever, with her hair floating about as if gravity didn't affect her. But what was most impressive about her were the red eyes staring at me calmly. She had calmed down, and come to terms with her situation. For a being who had been on the top of the food chain for thousands of years, it's surprising just how fast she had adapted to her new slave-like situation. Tell me where the spirits you are contracted with are. I asked her, staring straight into her eyes. She nodded. Someone as smart as her undoubtedly knew that if she messed around with me, or got on my nerves, I would kill her. Having mercy on someone who tried to kill me was something I couldn't afford. The only reason she is alive was because she would keep the other spirits off me. Suddenly, dozens of dark portals opened and she pointed at them. You can choose whichever one you want. But be careful, some of them can be dangerous. Oh, this bitch. Did she just try to trick me? Her eyes widened as she noticed me staring at her. The evil lady looked at me nervously, probably guessing what I had in mind. Who said I'm going alone? Fighting such strong spirits could lead me to my death. You know that sabotaging me could lead to your death. Don't test me again. She nodded. I I wasn't in any way implication to put you into danger, but simply giving you a choice. Smart. She had already found a loophole in the contract that I hadn't thought of. Well, it wasn't that big of a deal, as something like this couldn't have harmed me, because she would have to not withhold any important information from me. But maybe she could have said the information just when I was about to jump through, and that would have technically been not withholding information from me. Well, the latter was a clause I had intentionally put in. Knowing that she would find another way to withhold information from me, like deleting her memories. That would also be okay with the Gia's contract. Anyway, you are coming with. Show me which one of the portals leads to the strongest spirit. My words were neutral and didn't have any emotion in them. She knew what would happen after this was over. By failing right now, she had just pushed her time of death closer. There was no need to get angry over this small trickery. I predicted something like this might happen. Intelligence increased by one for predicting your enemy's carefully thought scheme. This was also one of the reasons I was willing to put up with it. She was an intelligent stat grind, always keeping me on my toes while making me stronger. When freezing the river, I knew that my Kai, or as it is represented in my status page's MP, was above what most masters had, meaning I could control a large amount of water. It would have taken at least three waterbenders to do what I had done to save the village. Seems like your friends flew off, the evil lady said with a confused look on her face. She then looked me in the eyes. What are you? No wonder she was confused, having seen my water clone with them. Maybe I will explain it once you give me something useful. I chuckled and offered her my hand. She then pointed towards one of the portals. That leads to the spirit of endurance, Namian, the strongest spirit I have been able to trick into a contract until now. What are its powers? Physical invincibility, she said casually. No arrows can pierce his skin. No fire can burn him. No weapon can even scratch him. Also, its strength and speed are quite powerful. Even I would have a hard time protecting myself if he attacked. Looking at her eyes, I saw that she seemed to be hiding something from me. Well, I couldn't read her expression, but going logically the evil lady still would try to trick me. If you hide something from me, the contract will kill you. Do you want to test it without thinking things through? Damn, for the first time she swore and winced. Finally, her true feeling slipped through, she was annoyed. With a resigned sight, she added, Even its eyes have a layer around it and can't be pierced? Well, that was some critical information. After all, when she worded it by saying that the lion had strong skin, most would attack its eyes, which would be the weak point of any creature. Do you know any weakness it has? Ash evil lady POV. What a fucking smart bastard. It was hard keeping my expression straight. How can a human who is so young be able to keep up with me in a battle of minds? It annoyed me to no end. But this scumbag was winning. I had no more tricks to pull. No. I don't know how to beat it. While it won't be able to actively kill me due to the contract I have with it, you are a whole other deal. This time deciding to be careful. I told him everything, and didn't try to withhold information. Damn it. I thought that during our first meeting he would have his guard down and think that I wouldn't try to get out of the contract so early. Should I have acted more panicked when we met? No, he might be my enemy. 
but he was smart enough to see through such acts. But Namian was my only chance to try and kill the brat. I tried all my cards in this meeting and it failed. Now that he knew that even I couldn't beat Namian in a straight battle, he will most likely refuse to fight him too. Fuck. When was the last time I played like this even Vardu wasn't this troublesome? Among spirits, rarely would anyone be able to keep up with me. But this slimy bastard was doing so casually. Okay, we are going to fight the spirit of endurance then. His name was Namian Wright. He said suddenly, happiness blossomed in my heart. This was the happiest I had felt in a long time. Excitement aspired within me that it was hard to keep a straight face. But somehow I was able to do so and nodded at soccer. Okay, then I will try and restrain him to the best of my capabilities. Screw that, even I wouldn't be able to restrain Namian. Because while he might be a relatively young spirit, only a dozen hundred years old, physically he was almost unmatched by any other spirit. Even though this brat might be smart, he wasn't anything special in the end. His young age and arrogance got the better of him. Yes, this was it. A short-lived human would never have the patience required to handle someone like me. I grasped his hand and we walked through the portal. As the darkness around us twisted and turned, I made sure that soccer wasn't hurt in any way, even by accident as that would kill me. How the hell did a brat like this get such a contract? I could still feel the shackles in my soul. After he is dead, I will investigate his life and see what happened. Wait, I can't do that. Because the contract he had would still be in effect even after his death. Oh well. I was happy right now as this pest is about to be killed. As we landed on the other side, we entered the spirit world. There were a dozen mountains around us, while we were in the middle of a flat field. A lion about the size of an elephant, he had yellow, gold-like skin, and each strand of his fur seemed like it was made of gold. The lion lay on the ground, sleeping. Sokka looked at his hand and waved it, and then smiled. Does bending work here? Yes, I said. We were transported physically here. So it would work. Was Sokka a bender? Well, it didn't matter either way. While observing him he had been under my watch most of the time. He was lucky, but his luck was just about to run out. Do you want me to try and restrain him? I asked Sokka, while sabotaging him was against the contract rules. If he told me to do it, then it would be okay. He shook his head. No. Then he looked at me with a gentle smile on his face that was a little creepy. By the way, you are really smart. Sadly, living for so long has breed arrogance and blinded you in one eye. Hey, Brad, keep talking. I want to see you die a brutal death. By the way, after this, you will receive a punishment. That didn't matter, but I still nodded towards him, trying to act as submissive as possible. Yes. Good, at least you understand. He then walked towards the lion, and when he was just outside of its reach, he waved his arms. A surprisingly huge amount of water was drained from the plants around us, and it moved into an arc. Namian remained sleeping, as someone who couldn't be injured, his instincts had suffered quite a bit. But that wasn't a problem, since no predator would be able to defeat him anyway. Eris, the evil lady, the spirit of strife, was quite ignorant. Though her outward appearance didn't say anything, I could guess what she was thinking about me. Living long had made her blind in one eye. It was inevitable. After all, being strong for so long had made her underestimate humans instinctively. For so long, they were creatures below her, and she saw them at a certain level. Essentially, she had gotten arrogant enough to underestimate me again. Even after I had just tricked and trapped her to essentially be my servant, she probably thought this would help her get out of the contract after the lion killed me. But she forgot something even spirits need to breathe, most of them at least. If this didn't work, then I always had the boots equipped so that I could teleport myself away and they had nine uses left. I slowly formed a giant bubble around the lion. At first even then he didn't seem worried and slowly opened his eyes. I pulled him up with the water, he tried to kick off the liquid, but it was impossible to do so. Boom he created a giant splash, almost breaking out of the bubble of water I had surrounded him in. But in the end, I controlled the water and had a lot of MP to keep this up. It would be a battle of how long he could keep his breath, or how long I could hold this. Even then, I wasn't just standing around as I rhythmically waved my hand, almost like a dance, and waves of water started entering the lion through its nostrils and mouth, invading his body. These spirits had forgotten how they were pushed by humans off their land, because after the humans learned that they could use bending to bend off and kill spirits, they immediately started building settlements even with spirits around. I glanced at the evil lady spirit while the contract would kill her and destroy her soul if she broke the contract. It was better to be careful of her, but she wasn't making any moves, just looking on in despair. Wait, did she just bet everything on this working? That was a good strategy as I might have had my guard down during the first meeting. Sadly for her, if I was in her situation, I would have done the same, and that helped me predict what she might do. Be prepared to give me something good, offer something valuable if you don't want me to kill you after this. I told the evil lady, making sure to smile at her nicely. This would unnerve her, showing anger would worry her, but not showing any when I am angry would scare her, but smiling when I was angry would terrify her. I wasn't some master manipulator or anything like that, but as a man who had watched a lot of horror movies, and was a failed actor at one time, I knew how to give a good scare. Being angry was normal, even expected. A killer who chased after you was scary. 
but a killer whose smile that you nicely was downright terrifying. With a twist of my wrist, I froze the water inside the lion spirit's body. Surprisingly, he only looked at me angrily as blood started flowing out of his ears, nose, mouth, and even eyes. Yet he still seemed to be okay. Shit. If he was at a lower level, I would have been able to see his health bar, and just how much health points it had cost. Honestly, in my last world, I had gotten many ideas on how to kill invincible enemies from movies, anime, books, manga, etc. Raw suddenly a large raw scattered the water ball, within an instant he was free. For a split second, I almost panicked, but calmly, I used this moment to use waterbending to manipulate the water that had turned to ice inside his body. I turned it back to water and used it to get into his vulnerable lungs. At one time humans used to eat spirits, so they probably had some internal organs too. Though I couldn't see where my water was going, I could feel it moving around the lion's body. Sadly though, the lion's spirit landed on the ground, as I wasn't able to gather the water fast enough to stop him. Boom he kicked off the ground, and the air around the spirit seemed to crackle. Damn, I can't see it at all. So within a split second, I opened my map and saw the red dot moving towards me. Tilting my body to the side, I was able to dodge his attack. Fwish. But one of my arms was but through, and so was half of my chest. Blood spurted out. Over 70% of my health points was lost in a split second, and I was close to death due to the bleeding effect. But I stood my ground, taking out a roll of bandage and with one arm, I bandaged myself. In the end, I was left with only 20% of my health as within a second, another 10% was gone due to the bleeding effect. The monstrous lion charged at me again. I saw it on the map. I used to think that I was quite fast, but those thoughts were now thrown out of the window. I couldn't even compare to this guy. Going by stats, just how high would his agility be? 300, 400, maybe even higher. No, definitely higher. Click. Still, I was fast enough to click my boots before he hit me again from quite a distance. No, I wasn't using them to run away. Instead, I will fight using them. Within a split second, I was atop the mountains, looking down at the lion, who stared at me with red eyes radiating an intense feeling of power. Fuck. I was scared as hell. But, I had to keep calm. Gamer's mind helped dull my fear by calming my mind. But it couldn't turn me into an emotionless robot. Hey, little cat, how about you come up here? I smirked at it arrogantly. Even though my arm hadn't regenerated. Wait, would it even regenerate? Well, it was no use worrying about it now. What had happened couldn't be changed. Also, this lion spirit needed to keep being angry at me. Because if it calmed down it might be able to think rationally, and that would become an even worse situation. I was close to death, in comparison, losing an arm was nothing. I will worry in the future about getting my arm back. Right now, there are more important things to worry about. Taking out my spear, I held it in one hand and spear mastery took effect. As long as I held a spear I would have a boost in stats. Normally holding a spear would impede my waterbending. But I just got a new idea. I bit into my spear handle, still technically holding the thing. So while it might look ridiculous, now I could have the boost in stats while using waterbending. One-handed waterbending was harder. But I got used to it and instantly froze the water in the lion's lungs. I just looked at the lion, and outwardly it seemed like nothing strange happened. By the way, how the hell was it able to roar while in a bubble of water? Was that roar done just by using the little amount of air it had in its lungs while he was sleeping? Well, it seems like that roar was something I will have to look out for too. Also, was this waterboarding I was inside his body even doing anything? Fwish. Once again, the lion charged. But this time the ground below it crackled. With each step it took, it became faster, as marks of its claws were left on the ground. Let's see who amongst us will win. You damn overpowered lion with a cheat-like body. It sounded kind of ironic for me to talk about cheat abilities. Namian Lion, a spirit who stood at the peak of power, physically. His skin was so tough that it's said that he was never injured. This kind of monster could take on armies. After all, it wasn't like any weapon or attack could injure it. Such a monstrous creature charged at me. I would be lying to myself if I said that fear wasn't crawling in my heart. But being afraid wasn't a bad thing. It would help me not become overconfident. So, with a scared, but calm mind, I turned the water inside his body into ice. But once again, the monstrous beast only stumbled for a bit, but didn't stop his leaps. What a damn monster. I drew all of the moisture from the plants around me, turning the luscious green mountain into a barren, dark land of death. Water encircled me into a rotating ring, and it was a little hard, but with the increase in agility, due to holding the spear with my teeth, Zoro style. I was able to move faster, and the area around me was turned into hard, slippery ice. Since I was atop a steep mountain, the Namian lion would have to try and climb ice on a downward surface. Crack! As his feet landed on the ice, he broke through as his claws sang on the hardened water. But even with all of the power behind it, the lion started slipping, unable to get a good footing. This was the advantage of having terrain superiority. Being in an icy land with water all around me, now the Namian lion was in my zone. The creature took a deep breath, and I immediately hit the Kai points in my ears. The pain was horrendous, and a ringing sound rang out. Blood came out of my ears. But I at least couldn't hear anything temporarily, as the ice around the lion broke apart. He had just roared, and that's what I had been on the lookout for. That dangerous roar would have probably paralyzed my body, 
or done something like that, because its power was outrageous. While I still took some damage from it, this was nothing as at the same time I also used my waterbending to attack his lungs, which were vulnerable during the roar. Truly, I was still suspicious of how much damage the lion had taken. Were my attacks even doing anything? It felt like that beast was some invincible monster. But those thoughts of mine were settled down once I saw the lion's legs trembling. I breathed an internal sigh of relief because due to my health points being so low, I planned on retreating. But it seemed like staying a little longer here would be more beneficial. Still, the situation wasn't in my favor yet. So as soon as I see something dangerous, I will have to run. Or else this place could turn into my graveyard. Lifting my hand, the water around me rose, following my command. Within a split second, it encircled the lion spirit, and it kept rotating around him. Namian opened his jaw as if to say something, but no sound came out. His lungs have been frozen over and over again. It's honestly baffling just how the hell was this thing still alive. It essentially hadn't been breathing the whole battle. Now, it was just a waiting game. My bleeding effect has stopped, and I had over 18% of my health points left. Suddenly my ears cleared up as the Kai blocking I had done on them cleared out. The elephant-sized lion growled at me and took another step. And that was when I got an idea. I took the spear back into my hand. Erebenders used their staffs to help with their bending, with a wave of my spear. Water attached to the spear's tip, and moved about in a giant whip-like manner. The water moved about easier than water bending with one hand. So I picked up the lion once again and started drowning him. This was the difference between us. I knew how to fight against someone stronger than me. If he got close to me, this lion could kill me in one hit, even do so with relative ease. But, now that I had turned the terrain into my advantage, slowly but surely, this monster would fall. Eris. I called out to the evil lady, bringing her out of her stupor. She must be worried about a lot of things. But I didn't care right now. This was the second time she has tried to get me killed. Restrain the lion. She nodded, her eyes turned calm, as always. It seemed like she finally got a hang of her emotions. But by now, I could easily guess what she was thinking. It wasn't that hard to do so anymore. Dark hair extended, and while it seemed like normally the evil lady might not be able to restrain the lion normally, now, the situation has changed. Her hair extended and seemed to grow like metallic wire as it wrapped around the lion. Like thick rope made of steel, the hair wrapped around the lion, clutching its libs tight. Ash evil lady POV fuck. Fuck. Fuck what the hell is up with this situation. He lost half of his upper torso and arm, yet he is still alive. This is madness. Just tying up some bandages stopped his bleeding too. Have I gone crazy am I under an illusion how? This isn't normal. It's beyond logic and understanding. I had made the grave mistake of assuming that Sokka was human. But that wasn't the truth. No matter how I looked at it, he wasn't a human. Even calling him a spirit would be an understatement. Maybe he is one of the beings like Old Iron, Vatu, Rava, and the Mother of Faces. Did he hide and disguise himself as a human? Why would he do so? Maybe for entertainment. He was playing with me all along. He was no simple human to begin with. No, I was the one who didn't notice sooner and acted arrogantly. Since, when he crushed me in a battle of minds, almost destroyed my conscience when I tried to read his mind. Then he also had that contract that bound my soul, which seemed to be almost off -worldly. I had never seen such a thing before. Now I could see it. Someone like Sokka, if that even was his name. He isn't someone I can mess with. The tug in my hair broke me from my thoughts. It felt like my hair would be pulled out of its roots. Though the Namian lion might be weakened, as Sokka had dealt devastating damage to it. But the spirit was still physically powerful. It felt like it would rip off my scalp. That was when I noticed Sokka getting into position, and Namian opened its mouth preparing another one of his deadly rolls. But Sokka, seeming to have already predicted this through his spear, which was powered by his waterbending, as a stream of water seemed to propel it into Namian's mouth. Slick. While the lion's skin was impenetrable, Sokka had weakened it enough to kill. The lion slumped on the ground, and I couldn't help but feel a trace of fear grasp onto my heart as Sokka's cold eyes landed on mine. He walked towards me, one-armed, but there wasn't even a trace of pain on his face. Neither did his body move strangely or limped due to the lost appendages. As expected, just how long did a spirit need to live to consider such things as pain unimportant? Putting his hand in his pocket, he took out a big bait fish. By now this wasn't even the strangest thing he had done. The fish was too big for something to fit in his pocket. Did he have some kind of spatial manipulation ability like me? He took big bites out of the fish, his eyes still kept staring into mine, in a creepily calm manner. Crushing even its bones with his teeth as he kept looking at me. Such a strange scenario. A one-armed man eating fish, while walking toward you. It sounded like a joke with a punchline. But this was reality, and I wasn't laughing. He stopped in front of me. We were close, and I could smell the aroma of the cooked fish. The small heat it radiated made it seem like it was just freshly cooked. Can you guess what I am thinking right now? Asked Sokka, munching down on his food, the fish's bones being crushed by his teeth. Answering him right now might get me killed. So instead I kept my mouth shut. This guy was dangerous, and I didn't want to try and play around with him in any way. Wish I had realized this sooner though. I am wondering if I should kill you or not, he said casually as if talking about the weather. I have half a mind to do so, but luckily for you, my mood is fantastic. What? 
he is in a good mood. But he almost died. Sokka turned around and went towards the lion. Only now did I notice something his arm had regenerated. Think of something you can give me. It could be an item too. But better think fast, because I might just decide to kill you. Sokka said, casually walking away. Shit, what can I even offer a guy like that? Many thoughts came to mind, and I didn't plan to hold back on my offers. Because my life depended on it. Since he seemed to be so strong, someone like me probably doesn't even qualify in his eyes. As Sokka walked towards the Namian lion, he turned on the notifications that he had muted during the battle. Such things would only distract him in a fight, but now he had a chance to check it. You predicted the Namian lion's roar? Intelligence increased by one due to outplaying your enemy. Wisdom increased by one you learned an original way to use waterbending. Wisdom increased by one. He skipped many notifications, and just got the summary if there were many of them. Especially amongst the level up notifications. The first thing that had changed was his stats. Name, soccer title, legendary beast slayer class. The gamer level, 30 to 43, health points. 2850 to 3500 MP, 900 to 1225 strength, 27 agility, 45 vitality, 25 intelligence, 32 to 33 wisdom, 26 to 28 luck, 186 point, hero to 65, he then checked the skills, the ones that had changed, waterbending level 10 to 16 spear mastery level 41 to 45 soccer smiled, the improvements weren't small, and I had many new things to contemplate, especially the new option he had gotten after level 40. Ash Soccer POV I decided to look into the gamer interface later, and instead, walked back to the evil lady. By now my arm had healed, sadly my clothes hadn't gamer's body was a weird skill. After all, game characters don't lose their clothes just because they got hit by an attack or injured. Still, it seemed like it could only fix clothes up to a small degree. Also as expected, as soon as my health points filled up, my arm regenerated. What a monstrous ability, it made me seem inhuman. This is all I can offer you, please spare me. The evil lady bowed down, her head touching the ground as she showed me a book. It didn't have any title on it, so I used observe. Inverted exclamation point book of 1000 spirits. Epic it has knowledge of a vast number of spirits. Their strengths, weaknesses, powers, etc. are all recorded in it. Author. Eris she also offered me many other items and trinkets that were useful, which I just shoved all of them in my inventory after making sure that they weren't cursed. Those were some good items. I complimented her. Then, picking up my spear with an elegant sweep, I cut off her head. The contract didn't let her resist in any way when I attacked her. With a swipe of my hand, the water rose and froze her body and head. Then I cut both of them into thousands of little pieces, making sure that she wouldn't resurrect or something like that. Because I still hadn't gotten a notification of her death. You have killed Eris, level 560 so she was at a higher level than the Namian Lion. That's a little surprising since she was much weaker than him in fighting capabilities. Sorry, Eris but I can't seem to be able to afford you. I said, and clicked my boots, and teleported away. Try to kill me once that's on you, and I might let you live for a while, because of the benefits. Betray me after that, and I will kill you, no matter what. Level 43 to 58 still. I got quite a lot from her. The new items are also very nice. Though, no matter what she gave me, I wasn't going to spare her in the end. I was teleported back to the beautiful and lush forest from where I had been before the evil lady took me to the spirit world. The trees were high, and could probably hide quite a lot on top of them. Laying down on the soft grass, I took a deep breath and started meditating. This was to organize my thoughts and contemplate some things. Also, I knew that meditation was the key to entering the spirit world, without having to rely on other, outside forces. Initially, I had thought that the Avatar was one of the only strongest creatures around. Though I had learned otherwise, and my latest opponent proved that this world wasn't as weak as I had initially thought it would be. Spirits like Old Iron, a giant samurai-like spirit that even Avatar Yangchen had difficulty beating in her Avatar state. Vato and Rava were at the top, but their powers weren't quite consistent, and neither of them stayed strong for long. In comparison to the time other spirits spent in their peak power, it was safe to assume that there were other spirits out there like the Namian Lion, those that had abilities to destroy armies. Such a thought was a little scary, but exciting at the same time. Fighting humans wasn't worth it, but killing spirits could mass level up me quickly. If people knew what I did, most would think that I also could destroy armies, because I was able to defeat the Namian Lion. But that wasn't the case at all. Just because I defeated him, it doesn't in any way correlate that I could defeat armies. I didn't have invulnerable skin or anything like it. Even if one soldier was able to do only 10 damage on average with numbers that would add up into a painful death. Still, even then, soldiers could do more than 10 health points of damage, especially in bigger numbers, as it would get harder to dodge the attacks. Still, even such an ability would be useless for me. If I went and just solved things with brute force, it would be stupid. Sure, I could go and do that, 
But then I would have to kill myself off to return everything to balance. Humans wouldn't come to accept having an overlord of power amongst them. There is the Avatar, but he at least is in a cycle that resembles humans and can die off. But the Avatar also will never become a king or any kind of leader. Only people with short foresight would do something like use power to solve such complicated problems. In the end, no amount of luck would be able to save me from stupid mistakes. For understanding the gist of the world and how human minds work, wisdom increased by one damn. If I had the time I could grind the intelligence and wisdom stats so easily. Some people found it more fun to work out and exercise. But for me, reading was easier. So essentially increasing intelligence and wisdom would be easier. Why would I waste my stat points when my favorite hobby was reading? The multidimensional chat was proof that other worlds existed, even though currently traveling to them was essentially impossible. That was something I will have to try and figure out after ending this war, and helping the Southern Water Tribe develop into something that the Northern Water Tribe would essentially take over later in the story. But now, I won't let that happen. I still remember from Korra, the Southern Water Tribe is essentially something the Northern Water Tribe controls. With a sigh, I opened my eyes and looked at my stats. I was tempted to try and put some stats into intelligence or wisdom, but that would be foolish. Those stats were a breeze to increase for someone like me who like to read. So with that in mind, I put them all in the one stat I had been unable to increase naturally despite many tests. Luck 186 to 326 chance hit level max no matter how improbable, when you attack. Once every 10 days, you have the chance of 100% hitting your target once by an attack. No matter how fast they are, or whether they try to dodge the attack. Worth evaluation level max it is said that every living being is the same, and has the same worth. One can't see that well, you can now, can only be used once every 24 hours. Oh these skills, while they sounded simple, this was something that would help very much. Because even in the later stages when I became stronger, chase hit was something that could be a trump card. At the same time, worth evaluation was like having information and seeing if someone was worth investing in without having to learn from failure. It got rid of the failure part. This would be essentially very crucial when I decided to build up the Northern Water Tribe. Still, while dangerous, looking back at it, maybe sparing the evil lady's life the first time was the best decision I could have made. Because I wanted to kill her back then too and never forgot what she had done. Still, sparing her momentarily had wielded some good benefits. Getting up, I dusted myself off and pulled out a spare pair of clothes from my inventory. They were green clothes that belonged to the Earth Kingdom's citizens. I had prepared myself for this for quite a while, and since my inventory space was quite big, it was essential to use it to hold onto things like these. I went towards one of the rivers and pulled up a blank mask that covered my face. From now on, it was crucial to make sure that people didn't associate me with being in two places at the same time. Also, I will have to think of excuses just in case I am found out, as it is better to prepare an excuse than come out with one immediately. Walking through the forest, it was quiet and the sound of animals chipping about. It was so peaceful and nice. After such an intense battle where even a slip of concentration could be fatal, this was something I was welcoming. Now that I'm, Katara, and my water clone were on their adventures, I had to do my part and gather an army. I wasn't going to wait until Susan's Comet to come around, because that would be very bad. It would essentially be my loss by then. Because while I was a lucky guy, my companions didn't share my luck. So I couldn't bet on Arn having the same encounter as he did originally. Plus, by now things had changed quite a bit that I doubted things would go the same. Also, after getting past level 40, I had unlocked the Minecraft crafting table, though it seemed to be more like an anvil as it could combine weapons and items. Level 50 allowed me to see the relationship levels. Katara had a 100 100s, so that was cool. Knowing that even after all our bickering, she cared about her dear older brother. The rest were mostly what I had predicted them to be around, except Zabuza. He was at two 100s, while he hadn't gone into negative numbers. By now I had thought that the man at least trusted me somewhat. It seems like once a ninja will always be a ninja. He was as untrustworthy as a shark, so it seemed like any kind of friendly or true working relationship we might develop in the future, it will have to be one based on benefits. I must keep myself two steps ahead of him and get the most jutsu from the man. Damn, he was a hard man to manipulate. In another world, where ninjas were all around the planet, Zabuza stood at one of the tables. Haku behind him with a woman with red, spiky, and long hair. By her side stood a middle-aged man with an eye patch. The meeting had a tense feeling to it. Haku, who was by the sidelines, felt her heart jump in fear of what might happen. So you went and killed off one of the richest people in the world and took his money. May questioned him coldly. This wasn't something she had told him to do. Not one of the richest people, but the richest person. Zabuza smiled, though the smile under his bandages couldn't be seen. But he was still holding his ground in the conversation. He had brought a huge sum of money back that would be able to be used by the resistance. To him, that was more than enough to help them. Also, Gato would have paid Zabuza that much even if he did 100 missions. But still, May was worried about the repercussions of this. After all, if they take over the hidden mist, then they will be known as the kind of ninjas who kill their clients. Who would want to work with that? Clients would just go to other villages. Also, most of Gato's wealth was held in stocks, 
or his own companies which he had invested in. Being rich didn't necessarily mean having all of that money on hand. Zabuza, while he seemed proud as he had taken matters into his hands, May was skeptical of something. Is he being manipulated? While someone like Zabuza was not well educated on what killing Gato would do, he acted too impulsive. Ash contemplated May. The people who pay for ninjas weren't always good. They usually wanted a problem to disappear. It was a common thing to have assassination targets, kidnappings, and many other shady things as ninja missions. But if word got out of what Zabuza had done, then even if they took over, it would economically cripple Hidden Mist Village. May wanted to yell at the man in front of her and bash his head in, but decided not to do so. Ninjas dealt with their problems in the dark, not so openly. I see, May smiled at him sweetly and nodded. Thank you for everything's abuser. This will be a big help, he nodded, getting up, catching on that he was being quietly dismissed. No problem. As he got out of the tent, May's eyes turned icy cold. You know what to do. We can't take back our village with someone like that in our midst. Also, erase all information that he was associated with us. Zabuza had been someone loyal to the resistance, and even tried to kill the Mizukij by himself in the past, endangering his life. Still, as Zabuza walked out, he looked around and saw other ninjas in the resistance looking at him. Their faces had become hard and cold due to the civil war. He could sense that something was wrong here. So he put a hand on Hacker's shoulder and whispered, We need to get out of here. Though he might not understand the geopolitical situation of a country or how the economy worked in great detail, the demon of the hidden mist knew one thing, and that was when people wanted to kill him. Hum, why did something happen? Inquired Haku even though he too was already next to Zabuza as they escaped. But Zabuza knew just how strong Mei was. Haku wouldn't be able to hold her back as boil and Lava Style heavily countered the Yuki bloodline ability. So in the end, he made his decision, taking out two scrolls and handing them over to his disciple. Take them, one of them will allow you to communicate with certain people, and the other has information on the people, and how to use the strange scroll. Don't worry. I will be right behind you. Though he said those words full of conviction, so much that even Haku believed the ninjas were the best liars. Zabuza planned on dying today. And he knew that if he didn't give Mei too much trouble, she hopefully wouldn't chase after Haku, who was uninvolved in these matters. As his student, Haku once again followed her teacher's words. But not even 10 seconds after she walked away, like the silent breeze in a forest, dozens of ninjas wearing masks with the hidden mist insignia on them appeared. Sigh. Can't you guys just fake my death or something? Zabuza asked, fearlessly taking out his giant sword. Fwish. Mei appeared in front of him, she had a gentle smile on her face. Sorry. But this is the best I can do for you. Don't worry. I will let that student that you love so much go free. ECH, don't talk about love, you bitch, he swore at her. Annoyed that she was talking about things like love, while at the same time making it clear that she will kill him. It's goddamn annoying. No matter which side I'm on, I always end up getting tossed aside. Then it's about time I make my side. Zabuza swung his giant sword towards Mei, who didn't even bother to dodge, as, within a second, the Embu surrounded him, and had stabbed their short swords into his body. The battle was a no contest to who would win, he was in their main base. Zabuza didn't bother to resist her, as while Mei's words sounded like she wouldn't do anything to Haku. If he gave her trouble, she would hunt down Haku like a mad dog. This was a clear, unspoken threat. Sorry, Zabuza, Mei apologized. If the world was a little kinder, it would allow people like us to dash. Shut the hell up, you bitch coughs abuser coughed out blood. As he wearily fell to the ground. I don't want the last thing I hear to be your annoying voice. May nodded. She hadn't wanted to kill him either. But this was the life of a ninja. One where even a single mistake would lead to their death. Um, Sokka and Kataro were atop Appa, flying towards their destination. It had been a few days since the last time the water clone of Sokka that was here with them was made. During the Great Divide when they passed through the canyon with the help of an earthbender. They were also accompanied by two rival clans that Arn helped make peace with. Not long after that, they had been caught in a storm and had to settle down. Sokka's clone kept glancing at Katara. Cough cough, maybe we should go and find you a doctor, suggested the clone. Don't worry. Sokka, it's just a common cold, she said with a smile on her face. He nodded and then looked at Ayn. How long do you think we will be staying here for? Ayn shrugged. Maybe a day or two, until Appa rests up to get us out of that storm he tired himself out. Okay then, I will be outside, exploring the surroundings. The water clone got up and walked outside. Ayn had an excited look on his face, and was about to ask if he could come along. But Sokka's water clone shut him off. Also please look after Katara, she seems a little sick. I told you I'm okay, Katara pouted. But Sokka's water clone didn't take her words into account. After walking into the forest it looked around suspiciously. Unlike the original, he didn't have any of the gamer interface functions. Even the skills he inherited from the original were barely 1 slash 10th as good, maybe even weaker. Still, though, he had sensed danger and could sense it around 0.01 seconds before it happened. Which wasn't useful, but today, the water clone had another goal. He wasn't here to explore as he said, but to dispel himself. Unable to send messages to the original, this was the only way he could notify Sokka that something was wrong. But something unexpected happened. Fwish. 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 
Arrows flew towards him with pinpoint precision, nailing him to a tree before he could react or do anything. The cone looked at the arrows and saw that they had only hit his clothes. Yain arches the clone whispered, before he slammed the back of his head into the tree, dispelling himself and turning back to water. That freaked out the other archers when they saw it. But they were soldiers trained into being calm and collected. They were the best archers in the world. So if there was something they didn't understand, it was best to report it to the higher-ups. They rushed back to their heavily guarded stronghold and saw a figure atop the wall. The archers immediately bowed. Princess Azala, we have some strange news to report to you. Oh, the young princess looked at the archers intrigued. She was someone who was considered a prodigy for her age and pretty enough that in the future any husband would be happy to have her. The archers who had come back seemed almost afraid as if they had seen a ghost. Only their strict training was keeping them from screaming out in fear. Then get on with it. I don't have all the time in the day. We saw one of Avida's comrades close by and tried to capture him. But we failed. The leader of the Yayan Archer's squad that was outside for tracking spoke with a shaky voice. The memory of Sokka turning into water still haunted him. The Fire Nation hadn't fought waterbenders in quite a while. But everyone knew that bending didn't mean one could turn their body into water. As suspected, the avatar is close by. But he knew that he would sound crazy if he said out loud what they saw. But he also understood that Princess Azala wasn't someone forgiving. Sokka, one of the avatar's companions, turned himself into water. Okay, so he is an illusionist, questioned Azala, and that was when the men came to a realization. While they had assumed immediately their enemy had a special ability that only a spirit would have, the princess had a more logical explanation to what they had seen. Still, running away from your enemy is treason, so spend a couple of months in jail. Maybe then you will understand that running away wasn't an option. Please, princess, forgive us. We only did what the commander wanted us to do. Please, but Azala walked off, not hearing any more of their excuses. What they were worried about wasn't going to prison, but being fired. Because if a Fire Nation soldier is imprisoned, it's the same as saying that he was fired. The Yayan archers had trained their whole lives in the art of the bow, so they didn't know any other way of life except how to be a soldier. Colonel Shinu, a tall man with mutton chops for a moustache, and he had on the traditional firebender uniform, but without the helmet. This person had initially been in charge of the fortress until Azala came. Princess, firing Yayan archers will come at a great cost, the man tried to persuade her. Training the archers takes a lot of time, and each of them is worth 20 men in any battlefield. Azala frowned and stopped walking, turning around and looking the colonel straight in his eyes. Are you questioning my decision? Dash no, princess, I am simply informing you that Yayan archers are hard to train. He swallowed nervously. Having seen what Azala was capable of, he didn't want to find himself on the opposing side of her wrath. She then turned around and kept walking. You would have to be stupid to let those men anywhere near close a battlefield. Didn't you see their eyes? They were scared of something unnatural. Yes, that must have been quite an illusionist dash. Are you brain dead? Azala questioned him. If an illusionist was so good, then he would be famous around the world. It's probably some kind of spirit. Then wouldn't that make it even more dangerous? No, spirits have been pushed off this world by humans. There is no reason to be afraid of them illogically. The young princess stated fearlessly. Also the next time you ask a question, you will be court-martialed. Why dash yes princess at the same time, in a forest far away? Something was moving through the trees like a shadow. Fwish. Sokka, who had just gotten the notification that his clone had been dispelled, was rushing towards where Ayn and Katara were. He had pinched them in his map since they were friendly, he could do so. But, unlike shadow clones, water clones don't send back memories. And that worries Sokka. Because in his mind, the worst kind of scenarios were playing. With the help of Skypiercer Spear, his running speed was almost as fast as a cheetah's top speed. These last days, he had been training himself, leveling up skills like Kai Blocking and Kaoshi style martial arts which have increased his agility quite a bit. Officially his agility passed over 50, so he had earned a new skill. Bullet time level max can be used only once a day, and for 10 minutes, it increases the user's running speed by 300%. He contemplated using it, but in the end, there was no other choice. Bullet time activated the world around him became darker and blurry, as his running speed increased past what he could keep up with. At first, he was almost about to smash into a tree, but luckily he was able to dodge it in combination with his sense danger skill. So, relying on his luck and sense danger, Sokka decided to use bullet time to its full limits, and he moved at speeds impossible for the human body. In a dark swampy land, trees, and wetness, a dark cave stood which had its entrance covered by vines. From the outside, the cave seemed almost sinister. Within it was Appa, who was laying down, sleeping after a long journey, and Katara's condition continued getting worse, with her fever heightening. She was barely able to move her body, but even through all of this, what worried her more was Sokka's disappearance. Her brother hadn't been back ever since he went out, and she worried that something might have happened to him. Arm had also gone to look for him and find Katara some medicine. He hadn't been back either. Kiwi, the little fox, was the only one here able to take care of Katara, by bringing her water or whatever she asked. 
The fox was scared because since she was so young, she couldn't use her ability to transform back into her giant form very often. It would take months before she could do so again. But the little fairy creature knew that Sokka wouldn't care about any of that. If Katara was hurt, Kiwi felt like this might be her last day of life. She didn't know what was going on with Sokka, but the little spirit doubted the enemies were able to kill the slippery guy. He knew when to retreat in case of a dangerous situation. At the same time, An, who was outside flying with his glider, kept looking around and looking for any sign of civilization. But he wasn't having much luck. Only dark, wet swamps greeted his sight, and it seemed to go on forever. He had a worried look on his face as it felt like everything was going wrong. With Sokka disappearing, then Katara got sick, and now he was unable to even see any life of human settlements around. How could things even get any worse? Fwish. An arrow suddenly flew towards him with a precise, straight line trajectory. Arn tried to dodge, and he was barely able to fly out of the arrow's way, and got a small cut on his cheek while doing so. That was fast, he muttered, never having seen an arrow so fast. But now he was on guard and felt confident. Fwish. Fwish. Twenty other arrows came. Arn was able to not have any of the arrows hit him, but only barely so. Suddenly, he started plummeting, and looking up he noticed that a couple of flaming arrows had hit his glider. When did the arrows land? He was confused, but couldn't do anything but be ready for a fight. Yet, Arn was confused by where his enemies even were, as he hadn't caught clear sight of them yet. He glanced at his glider regretfully. That was the last relic he had that the monks had made for him. Without having much time to think about it anymore, Arn used a soft stream of air to stop himself from slamming to the ground. That caused some water to rise. Fwish. 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 Wish. Hundreds of arrows bombarded him, each of them was outside of his vision, their view blocked by the droplets of water that had risen. These archers were experts, the best Arn had ever seen. He was barely able to swing his arm to create a wall of ice in front of him. It stopped some of the arrows, but one arrow hit at its weak place, causing some cracks, and another arrow hit the already stuck arrow, snapping the other arrow in half. This forced the cracks in the ice wall to get larger, breaking the ice wall. Arn jumped back, but noticed that there was a tree behind him, which was good for the time, as it would at least protect his back. He tried to use the swampy waters around, but three arrows hit his arm, one pissing straight through his palm, making him wince as blood dripped from his hand. Due to the pain, he lost contraction, and his water bending was interrupted. Ugh. Arm screamed out in pain, as a dozen other arrows came at him, and hit his clothes, nailing him towards a tree. Normally, without his hands and legs, Ung might have been vulnerable, but Sokka had taught him that bending can be done with all parts of the body. That included head, fingers, chest, and even tongue. Buff. But suddenly, a strange smell came into his nose. He noticed that a gas bomb was thrown in front of him, and he slowly passed out. No Katata those were the last words he muttered as unconscious darkness claimed him. From behind one of the swamp trees, Azala walked from behind it, and she had a pleased smile on her face. The Yain archers are truly remarkable. I didn't have to even get involved. The said archers came from their hiding places which included behind the trees, atop trees, and some were hidden in the swampy waters, covered in mud. It's all due to your plan, Princess Azala. That things went so smoothly. Yes, the knockout gas was a genius idea. Azala smiled. These archers had impressed her too. She had never thought that they would be this good at following her plans. Yes, now prove your skills to me once again. By finding the man called Sokka, and the other female companion that the Avatar is with. We wouldn't want one of them to come and free him. The next time Ang opened his eyes, he was chained in a metallic coffin with only his head out and he was mid-air, held up by dozens of chains. There was no water in sight, so even if he could bend with his head, airbending wasn't enough to break metal. Still, Arn was more worried about Katara. She had been left alone and sick, she wouldn't be able to fight against anyone. He guessed that Sokka also was captured by the archers. A despairing feeling filled his heart, he winced as he tried to clench his hand inside the metallic coffin. But it was the one an arrow had pierced during his capture. The situation has become worse. There was no one out there to help them now. In the swampy regions of the outside, two archers that were out scouting, had caught sight of the cave and noticed that there were some footprints outside of it. They had been swiped by some leaves to cover them, but the archers had been professionally trained to track their prey. They smiled. Today was their lucky day. Princess Azala will reward them handsomely for their work. Fwosh. Suddenly they heard the sound of wind being cut so fast that it made crackling sounds, like a whip. Turning around they immediately felt like they were flying like ragdolls, and saw two headless bodies in the ground. Wait those were their bodies. Just like that, their consciousness slipped. Ash Sokka POV I cut the two unsuspecting soldiers that were outside of the cave Katara was in. Right now, I wasn't in the mood for mercy, but putting the bodies in the inventory was the best way to get rid of any evidence. I didn't want my cute little sister to be traumatized by them. We were better than the Fire Nation and didn't go around killing people. Of course, that's what she needed to continue and believe. Because sadly, wars couldn't be won by soft people. Sometimes you have to be a lion to be the lamb you really are. If you want peace, 
Then use your power and make it a peaceful place. Talking things out never worked in any war. You have to crush your opponents to make them listen to what you have to say. I went towards the cave and saw Katara leaning on Appa. Also, Kiwi was standing in front of my sister. The little fox was shaking in fear, and her eyes were closed. She opened her mouth and shot out a fume of smoke. Cough, cough, then she started coughing. What a pathetic display of fire. But she wasn't even a month old, so I could see why she was so weak. Crouching down, I petted the cute little fox and smiled at her. You did a good job, Kiwi. Sometimes I might be harsh on her, but that's just so she will be kept in line and no oppositions weren't those of equals. Katara dotted and spoiled her enough for both of us anyway. Speaking of Katara, I walked towards my little sister and saw her looking at me with a tired smile that crushed my heart. Sokka, am I hallucinating again? You think your mind can hallucinate this handsome face? I took a frozen frog out of my inventory and stuffed it in her mouth. Frog of the swamp level 1 its skin has very good healing medicine, though it's only released when they are frozen. Due to the map and observation skill, it was easy to find a frozen frog. I still remembered from the show that she needed this to be healed from the cold. The medicine worked like a charm, as Katara quickly got up and spit out the frog. That had now come back to life. She looked at me for a little bit before sighing. We have to go and find Ung. He hasn't been here for a while either. Your relationship with Katara increased due to the relationship already being at max. You haven't gained any relationship points with Katara. What a silly girl. She was worried about me needlessly. Opening the map, I saw that Ahn was in the nearby fortress. He had been captured, but by whom? Zhao was the one supposed to be in charge, but the man is already dead. Well, I am about to find out soon. Can't have the Avatar be treated so roughly. With Katara by my side, we started searching for Ahn, while in reality, I was guiding her towards the fortress, along the swampy mud, which Katara froze so we could walk on it freely. I saw a small piece of his glider and showed it to her. It smells like it was burned a little. She frowned. Fire Nation. Probably, normally I would joke and sarcastically say you think so, because it was obviously from the Fire Nation. But I kept these words to myself, knowing that Katara was worried, and I didn't want her to feel even worse. Still, judging by the footsteps in the swamps, there were bound to be some scouts around here. If they get close I would notice in my map and try to walk around them. Still, none had seen us. When I fight with normal humans, I don't plan to use bending. Essentially a spear is better anyway since Spear Mastery can deal with humans easily. The only reason I used waterbending most of the time was to fight gigantic creatures or those that I needed to keep my distance from. One day, Katara will come to learn about my bending, probably. But that won't be anytime soon. She was already insecure enough about herself, adding that one would make it even worse. Also, I didn't want our enemies to know my abilities. This was the main reason, but no one needed to know these things. It didn't take long before we came into a fortress that was a structure made up of multiple stone walls surrounding a large pagoda tower at the center of the base. Poshuai Stronghold A Fortress of the Fire Nation. It is used as a major material depot. Its walls are coated with iron to protect it from earthbenders. Oh, Observe showed a lot more than I thought it would. Usually, it had limited information in such large structures, but I guess it has been leveling up since I used it quite a lot. Katara, level 18 a young waterbending girl, knows some waterbending, recently has had a growth spurt in her bending. She used to be level 7 at the beginning of our journey, but it seemed like she had grown quite a lot. Giving her that waterbending scroll wasn't so bad after all. Hopefully, she will be at least level 50 soon. That way she can be even more helpful in battle, and truly stand by my side. So what's the plan? She asked me, knowing that I was the guy who usually handled battle strategies. There were a couple of hundred soldiers in there, and those yarn archers were dangerous even for me. I wouldn't fight such a battle as the chances of me losing were pretty high. Depending on the commander, winning in a head-on battle could even be straight up impossible. Using map, I checked who the highest leveled person was. Usually, this would be useless as it showed the strongest person and not the commander. But at least I needed to know who to take out first. Azala, level 48 oh now that shows who the commander is. This just became even more troublesome. Azala, if this was the endgame Azala, that was deranged and without a strategic thought in mind, then that would be good. But this was the smart and ruthless Azala, the one who single-handedly took down Ba Sing Si without an army. She didn't even have the arrogance that could be used against her after she took Ba Sing Si. If Ahn wasn't the avatar, I would have let him in there a little longer. I was at a disadvantage in this battle, no matter how you looked at it. Well, this is the plan. I started instructing Katara. Not long after that, Sokka walked to the front gates of the fortress, still wearing his Earth Kingdom green outfit. Stop. Who is there? Of course. The Fire Nation soldiers stopped him at the gate and Sokka smiled. I am Kuzan, a spy of the Fire Nation. There is some urgent news that I need to send to the Fire Lord. Wait here, said one of the commanders. Unlike normal, Sokka had used the transformation jutsu to darken his eyes and hair, while making his face a little more older looking, around 18 years old. He did this while away from Katara's view, because he knew that Azala was competent enough to recognize, or 
at least suspect him from some posters that were already made of him. Soon enough, Azala herself came from atop the wall and looked down at Sokka. Kuzan, I never heard of a spy name like that. I can explain everything. If you allow me to, Princess, Sokka clasped his palm to his fist to show his respect. Her yellow eyes immediately narrowed on him in suspicion. I don't think I have ever met you before. Yet, you know me. What am I to make of that? My job is to deal with information, Princess Azula, Sokka added respectfully, trying to sound as much like a Fire Nation soldier as possible. Hem Azula kept staring at him, and then smiled slightly. Okay, open the gates, let Kazan. What was your name again? Kuzan. Sokka could tell that she was testing him and he didn't want to say anything that would invite suspicion. But as soon as the doors opened, he was greeted with a row of iron archers pointing their bows at him and firebenders in front of them ready to burn him alive. Did she figure it out? Ash wondered Sokka, getting ready to pull his spear out of the inventory as soon as possible. But he still acted his part for now and put his hands up. You can check me for weapons if you need to. Also, just to clarify, I am not a bender. Azala came in front of the troops, with her hands behind her back as if daring him to attack her. How did you know I was a princess? Not even my father's spies would dare spread such information. Sokka bowed down on one knee. It was due to the way you walked, Princess Azala. The way I walked. Yes, you walked as if you owned this place. She smiled. You are quite competent. What was the information you wanted to give my father? This is better spoken privately, he muttered, glancing at the soldiers behind her. Azala chuckled amusingly. Send him to the cells, maybe that would be private enough for him. Also, try better next time. I have memorized the names of every spy outside of the Fire Nation. Sokka didn't resist as the soldiers came in to imprison him. Instead, he stared Azala in the eyes, and as the soldiers escorted him, he whispered to her, Come and meet me when you are ready. Ashkatara POV I observed my brother from far away, and saw that he was captured. Seeing someone you love being taken away as a prisoner would be hard on anyone. But I kept my mind clear and tried to think calmly, reciting Sokka's words. If I am not captured, I will rescue An. If I am captured, then use the Soas to enter the fortress, while everyone's attention is on me. Those were his exact words. But it didn't calm me as much as I wish they did. Because plans do fail, and in this case, failure might lead to his death. He had no weapon on him either, so he wouldn't be able to protect himself. If it came down to it, who would I save? Arn or Sokka? Though this wasn't the exact situation, I couldn't help but think about it. Essentially that was choosing between my brother and the rest of the world's safety. I didn't like the answer which came easily to me. It seems like I was more selfish than I thought. I was escorted to the prison by Azala. It was a little surprising that the Fire Nation kept their spies' catalogues. That was dangerous, and it showed that they did not doubt that there were no spies within their ranks because if there were then it would destroy the whole spy network, because all they would need is their spies' names and appearances. That was a very big weakness to have. Azala was smart, but a little naive and inexperienced to reveal something like this. Due to tricking an intelligently talented enemy, your intelligence increased by one tricking. I didn't trick her of anything, she simply made her assumptions about me. I will use that against her. Maybe getting within Fire Nation's ranks wouldn't be so bad. It just needed a bit of luck to not be discovered, luck the only thing that I had plenty of. Wait, what if Azala was lying about the whole document with the spies' names? Because that would be a stupid thing to have, though I wouldn't put it past Ozai to have something like that, since he was quite deranged. In comparison to his predecessors and their strategic mindset, he hadn't achieved much during the years as Fire Lord. Now I just had to cook up a story for Azala, one without any holes in it. Hopefully, this works. Ash Azala POV Kuzan was an unfamiliar name that I had gotten to know recently, and it was an old-timey name. More more appropriate to being used a hundred years ago than in these times. There were many suspicious things about Kuzan, if that was even his real name. But there was nothing that directly pointed to him being suspicious. Such a strange man, it was as if he had appeared out of nowhere. But such a thing was ludicrous, and it was only because I hadn't done enough of a background check on him. Eventually, the news will come of who he was, but for now, I should do my investigation and go ask him questions. Show me to the new prisoner's cell. I ordered one of the guards nearby, and they saluted me, showing that they were obedient. They are sheep, each, and one of them was like lamb, even the highest commanders wouldn't dare fight against me. Arriving at the young spy's cell, it was dark, unlighted, and made of metal. There was only a small opening in the door, but even then there was not enough space to put a finger through. Looking through the crack of the door, I was able to see Kuzan's body in the darkness, sitting on the ground. It was a little creepy how his dark eyes seemed to fuse with the darkness around him. Such unnatural looks. Are you ready to talk? That was the first question I asked him. He on the other hand chuckled, talking from outside the door. Are you scared of me, an unarmed man, in a dark cell with guards all around if anything were to happen? This bastard. I will burn him alive. Looking at the guards, I narrowed my eyes, opened the door. As the door opened, I walked in and blue flames gathered in my hand, lighting the room around us. The man looked at my fire and smiled. Your fire is beautiful. Flattery will get you nowhere. Though saying that was a little late, because everyone had told me that my fire was strong, dangerous, and intimidating. No one ever called it beautiful. Has no one ever told you? 
He inquired as if reading my mind. You should get out more. Fire isn't all about destruction. There is something strange about him. Should I just burn him to death? That would save me a lot of time and needless talks. He seemed intelligent enough to understand just how dangerous the situation was. So why is he playing around? Do you want to die? I asked him as the fire in my hand grew and became stronger. You shouldn't test my chances like this. Kuzan on the other hand didn't stop smiling and just leaned back on the wall as he was sitting down. Sorry, sorry, it's just that making yourself seem more human and pitiful would usually work against other people. What an emotionless bastard. He wasn't even afraid of death, knowing that he could die at any moment. There was no chance of him being able to do anything to me without a weapon on him, and in such an enclosed room made of metal. Still, I could see that he was very skilled, and even knew how to manipulate emotions. This was what most would call a born schemer. He would be useful. Sadly, I didn't trust him at all, and he too was untrustworthy. Now it was better to change the conversation as fear tactics didn't work on him. What was it that you wanted to tell me? This place is very private. Sigh princess, he said in a tired voice, looking at me as if I was stupid. You need to learn more about the world. Who would give you information after threatening them? You need to be their friend first. Torture would only make them say whatever you want. That would make them get out of the torture. Damn, he was right. This guy was undoubtedly a skilled spy. That made sense. Now I wanted him even more under me since his use went beyond what I expected. Someone like him wasn't something we could just train. Well, how about we get to know each other? I smiled and sat down in front of him, keeping the fire bright in my hand, so he could see me, and I could see him. Now that's more like it. Start talking about yourself, and try to get me more comfortable. Remember to use half-truce as that puts the target more at ease. Okay? This guy just became ever more dangerous. We need him on our side. Or else, I will have to try and kill him. Ash Soccer POV. What a stupid girl, trying to act smart, which she was, but that naive side that comes from a young age is still there. What I needed from her wasn't to convince her of anything, but the half-assed words that I heard on some YouTube video of a retired FBI agent. At least I think that's where I heard it because the internet was a sea of information where I learned useless things. Though here, they were like a wealth of knowledge. The best public speakers, their speeches, all stood behind me. No matter how smart Azala was, she stood no chance. She will be interested in me, never expecting that was what I wanted. And Katara was the main force of the rescue, with Kiwi and one of my water clones keeping an eye on her. Yes, that's it. Now tell me some half-truths about your childhood. The closer to the truth, the better. I smiled at her reassuringly. Now it was time to try and get on Azala's good side. For being able to trick an intelligent person, intelligence increased by one. She was an intelligent stack grind. The best king too since she would keep me on my toes and learn fast. Normally a normal person might feel pressured that she would surpass them, but sadly for her, the higher her intelligence, the better it was for me as I would always be a step ahead due to my gamer interface. Azala was a tricky opponent, and I had guided her into a battle of intelligence to increase my intelligence stat. But the last thing I wanted was to get overconfident and lose. That would be a horrible way to go out. She looked at the ground for a split second, seemingly contemplating what to say. My mother thought I was a monster. By her smirk. I could tell that she thought she could trick me like this. But I knew the truth behind it. This was the absolute truth. Azala's mother was abusive, though in a different way from Ozai. Telling your child she was a monster. What kind of parent does that? Well, some might say it in the head of the moment but never mean it. At least most of the time, Azala looked at me strangely as if waiting for me to say something. Right? She could never imagine that I would know something so personal about her in any logical way. Well, since she told me something about herself, I will match it with something of my own. Not about my life as soccer, but as someone else. I lied to the people I loved. Initially, I used to tell them everything, but then I started isolating myself, lying to hide my true self that was a failure in reality, until I realized that it was too late to say anything. Would she be able to tell whether I was lying or telling the truth? She was hurt by her truth, but I wasn't. Mine had been dulled by the passage of time. There was regret, no denying that. But it was useless to think about it now. Even if I had told them how much of a failure I was back then, it would have only worried them needlessly, and I would have regrets for telling them. Yeah, this was the kind of thing that had no right decision. Or maybe there was one, but I just couldn't see it. Azla muttered confused. I am good at telling when people are lying, but I just can't seem to read you. The best liar that I ever saw. She didn't know what I told her was the truth, just like she did with me. So even if she saw past my deception, there wasn't anything I was hiding. You have outplayed a highly intelligent person. Your intelligence increases by one even the gamer interface seems to address her as smart. Was she as intelligent as I thought? Well, guess she was, though I consider Iroh to be smarter. Or maybe he is just wiser. Azala had a strategic mind with high intelligence. Iroh was smart too. But he was wiser than smart. How long until Katara saves on? Come on sis. Do your job, your brother is spilling his heart here to the enemies. It's your turn now princess. We can't stop this little game of ours. Let's see who goes further. She took that as a challenge and turned off her fire. The prison room immediately became dark. It was as if she was testing me whether I would attack her. That's a pretty good idea. 
but I wasn't here to attack her. No one in this world loves, she said emotionlessly. Oh, so she turned off the fire so I wouldn't be able to see her face. It seemed like I misunderstood her there. Well, we have already gone this far. There was no reason to stop here. Though I did wonder just how desperate she was to say these things to someone else, even under the guise of a lie. It's your turn now, she said. There was no tone of taunting in her voice. Just simple seriousness. Well, it would be useless to try and lie now. I never tried hard enough in my life. That's why I failed. These regrets will haunt me for the rest of my life. I taunted my brother when our mother died. Due to my greed. I wasn't able to see my loved ones even in their last moments. This went on for an hour. We were telling half-truths to each other. By now we both knew that we were telling the truth, but neither said anything. Princess Azala, the avatar has escaped, one of the guards came. By the tone in his voice, he seemed scared that she would do something. But instead, she calmly got up and opened the door, turning around just before she walked out, we stared at each other's eyes. Wait here. Sure, I smiled. This girl was an intelligence stat grind, just by talking for an hour. I had gained an extra three intelligence points. It was all in the beginning too, since after a while she started realizing that we were both doing the same. Katara and Arn were going back through the sewers, waterbending their ways through it. How were you able to get to me? Asked Arn, knowing that there were hundreds of guards around here. Sewers, air vents, steam pipes, answered Katara with a disgusted look on her face. I don't want to talk about it. Then where is Sokka? That sounds like something he would come up with. Katara was worried about that too. He had told her that she shouldn't worry, and that he will be with them, waiting with Appa. But as she saw the light at the end of the sewers, Katara was ready to breathe out a sigh of relief. But then remembered where she was and decided to hold her breath for a little longer. Once they got out of the sewers, she was about to cheer, but stopped once she saw dozens of Fire Nations guard around them. Boom, they shot blasts of fire at them, but Arn came forward and used airbending to change the fire's directions, hitting the nasty water around them. Katara didn't stand idle either, so she used waterbending to manipulate that same nasty water, and hit the soldiers in the face with it. Agate splashed in my face. It smells so bad. Some got in my mouth. Though she didn't do a lot of damage, the nastiness of the sower waters was enough to make the soldiers fall in disgust. That's quite an effective method, a feminine voice rang out, making the soldiers forget their disgust, and readily stand up. Katara saw that it was a young woman with a dangerous look in her eyes. There seemed to be fire lit in her eyes. It seemed like there were hundreds of soldiers were there to accompany her. Avatar, how about you get back in your cage? Maybe then I won't hurt your girlfriend, Azala said maliciously, the murderous look in her eyes intensifying. But suddenly, a roar came from the sky, confusing the Fire Nation soldiers. That was when Appa landed down, and with a swish of his tail, created a huge wind that pushed everyone else to the ground. While Sokka, who was riding Appa, smiled at Katara, told you I would be safe. Katara wanted to go and hug him, she was worried, and she could never get used to this. But decided against it as they had to escape, she and Arn got in Appa and flew away before anyone else but Azala who shot blue flames at them could do anything. She had used a blast of fire to counteract the pushing power of the wind, making such a split-second decision wasn't something most people could do. But even that, that didn't help her get the avatar. As they were in the sky, Katara breathed a sigh of relief, asking her brother curiously, How were you able to get out of there? I have my ways, Sokka smiled. My ninja ways. She chuckled for once not minding her brother's jokes. Azala looked at the avatar as he escaped. She knew that her father would be disappointed. But strangely, she didn't feel as disappointed as she would have normally felt. Instead, she calmly walked off while looking at her soldiers with disappointment. They all felt fear at her looks alone, as she didn't need to say anything. As she got inside the fortress, a panicked soldier came towards her. Princess Azala, the prisoner, he a Fire Nation soldier's helmet flew through the air. Fwish. Bam. It hit the talking soldier on the back of the head, knocking him out. She saw Kuzan, his eyes looking at her hypnotically. He had a smile on his face. Were you able to catch the avatar? I never told you we had the avatar. Azala narrowed her eyes suspiciously, ready to attack him. The guards speak an awful lot. Better not have them know anything next time, Sokka said. He had sent the water clone to go and help Katara and Arn. Initially, he had planned to go with them and rejoin the group, but something more interesting had crossed his path. You didn't leave. She questioned one last time, looking at his green clothes that were neatly suited, showing that he didn't have any difficulty taking out the guards. Also, if you killed any guards, I will have to hunt you down. No, don't worry. I didn't kill anyone, Sokka reassured her, and then added amusingly. I didn't have time to escape. That is a lie, Ash Ezra thought. She could tell by how casual he was about taking out the guards, that he could have easily escaped while she was busy with the avatar. To Azala Kuzan was a puzzling person. Due to their talk, she knew quite a lot about him. But still, he only became more puzzling. Normally she would have burned someone's face off if they acted like that, and made them spill their secrets. Still, initially, she had thought that he might be a little suspicious. Even after their talk, his identity was revealed that he was a genuine living person of the Fire Nation. Though the information was hard to find, it was still there. Kuzan was the name of a Fire Nation citizen who was a friend of the Avatar back in the day. 
His son had gone to become a spy and had later died a natural death during Azalon's reign. It seemed like certain spies never came to her father after Azalon's death, and Kuzan's father was one of them. Kuzan himself was named after his grandfather. That was all the information she could get from the person named Kuzan. Currently, Azala has him accompany her on a ship. Where are we going? I don't think the Avada went this way. Sokka said his thoughts while leaning on the railing of the ship, almost about to fall off. I heard that you have gotten close to the soldiers, Azala uttered, looking at his green clothes with disgust. For some reason, he wasn't wearing the red that represented the Fire Nation. She also knew that threats wouldn't work against him, so she didn't try to persuade him the normal way. Sokka was able to tell that she just changed the conversation, dodging his question. She knew that he would see through that too. But in the end, he didn't point it out and just shrugged. Well, it's fun to get to know your underlings a little. Let's make something clear here. They are my underlings, not yours. So don't try anything you might regret later. Azala hated to admit it. But the man in front of her was charismatic. There was no denying that he always seemed able to get close to other people easily, even with someone like her. Sure, sure, Sokka waved her off. Anyway, when are we playing the next Liar Liar game? The Liar game, that's what they called it. But both knew they said the truth during those times. Azala was a little worried about how much she had revealed to him, and wanted to gather her thoughts a little. He seemed unaffected by his past mistakes, but she was different. We will pause it for a while, she decided, walking next to him and leaning on the railing. Why don't you try a new game? Tell me about your father. Though Kuzan's father was figured out to be a spy, there wasn't a lot of information on him. Like, what kind of person he was. Such things would be useless to hold within the Fire Nation books. But Azala was curious about it. Hum, Sokka thought a little as if deciding what to say, and what not to say. He was a good man. Worked hard, but sadly hard work doesn't equate to a successful, or happy life. He eventually died when I was young. But Sokka gazed at the water with a strange look in his eyes. He taught me many things from his mistakes. Though I ended up making quite some mistakes myself. Either way, Azala could see that while Kuzan didn't seem sad, there was a strange atmosphere around him. It made her heart beat a little faster. She was genuinely interested in what kind of life he lived. After all, it seemed so opposite of her life. But she wondered, how did it lead to Kuzan becoming like this? She and Sokka continued talking for days to come. It seemed like they always were together, and the crew had made their own opinion of what was happening here. But knowing how Princess Azala was, none of them dared gossip while she was on the ship. They had arrived at their destination and landed in a port, walking towards a giant circus tent. Azala, like always, kept staring at Kuzan, which seemed to send the wrong message to the crew. But in reality, she was trying to see his reaction. Was he confused? Surprised? After all, going to a circus was so out of nature for her. Even if Kuzan was someone she considered quite smart, even he wouldn't be able to guess why she was here. Surprisingly, Azala was the one who became intrigued about his expression. He seemed neutral as if he already knew where they were going and what was happening here. Though he can't know this. In the end, after contemplating, Azala decided to ask him, since she couldn't tell what was in his mind. So, what do you think? Hum, think about what? Sokka glanced at her confusedly. Azala only narrowed his eyes. About the circus of course. Aren't you curious why someone like me would come here? Sokka just stared at her. Why would I want to know that much about you? I am not some creepy stalker or control freak. That wants to know what even goes inside your mind every waking moment. He said sarcastically. But Azala felt like an arrow was hitting her heart with each of his words. Because by the way, he was describing things. It seemed like he was talking about her. With a heavy sigh, Azala calmed herself and didn't show any emotions on her face. I am not a stalker. You are just a suspicious guy I want to know about. Ash she thought, trying to console herself that she wasn't being creepy about him in any way. Ash soccer POV dash Azala, yells out a girl, with an excited voice. I didn't even need to look at her to know that it was Ty Lee. The gymnastic girl walked towards her friend doing a backflip and bowed down respectfully in front of her. Princess Azala, Ty Lee. I need you to help me catch the avatar, Azala laid it on directly, without even trying to entice her. She needs to learn a lot about how to handle people like a leader. There needs to be something enticing, not just threatening them, or expecting them to follow you because you are a princess. That was just bad leadership, because when they betray you, then you will become all surprised. Well, that did happen to Azala in the show, and she went crazy. Seeing Ty Lee in a conflicted position, knowing what would happen if she refused Azala, she was about to say something. Probably to try and say no to her friend in a nice way, but Azala doesn't take no for an answer. So in the end, I decided to intervene. How about you offer her something? What? Azala looked at me with her iconic death stare. Who are you? Tai Li on the other hand was confused about who I was. She looked at my clothes that were of the Earth Kingdom green, and that only seemed to baffle her more. Azala, I smiled at my new friend, kinder friend, maybe a friend. I don't know what we were, 
but it was someone that she trusted to be competent enough. How about offering something? After all, only threatening them, or expecting people to follow you just because you are a princess isn't the correct thing dash Kuzan. She called me by my fake name, and the murderous look in her eyes had intensified. Are you questioning my decision? Was she threatening me? Well, that won't work anyway. No, simply saying my opinion on the matter. If you keep pushing people, they'll run away eventually, leaving you behind. Just like your mother did. Though I didn't say that, it was implied there. We both knew too much about each other now. But I could use my knowledge to say something that would hurt her. But Azula needed to come back to her senses as she didn't have a lot of time. She casually walked towards me, with her hands enveloped in a hot blue fire. Maybe I should teach you a lesson. Don't misunderstand my kindness for weakness, Kuzan. With a sigh, I walked towards her too, and just we were an inch apart from each other. I looked at her fearlessly, knowing that at such a close range, I could incapacitate her in a second, and she didn't seem fearful either confident in her abilities. Would this develop into a battle? Well, if I have no other choice, then I will go all out against her. I wasn't the kind of guy who took it easy on anyone, if they had malicious intent towards me. But Azula needed to learn that she wasn't the strongest out there, and the world is a big place. Picking fights carelessly could end up in your death. I still smiled at her, she had an angry frown. But I had a smile. So, what do you think of my suggestion? Tai Lee looked on at this from the sidelines, her body quaking in nervousness. What she was afraid of was Azula's anger, but also what seemed even more terrifying was that the boy, Kuzan, was strangely calm. Ever since she could remember Tai Lee could read people's auras, and that was why Kai blocking came easily to her. But right now she was seeing something strange, normally people's aura would change colors and fluctuate depending on their emotions. But Kuzan's aura was strange, his didn't fluctuate even though he should be feeling something. His feelings seemed very calm. Tai Lee imagined that if she could see the aura of an inanimate object, then this was how it should be. Uh, guys, let's stop fighting. How about being friends? She nervously intervened, knowing that this might get her in danger. But she was worried about Azula too, as Kuzan seemed very strange. Azula on the other hand was still enraged and ready to fight him. But hearing Tai Lee's voice calmed her down. So in usual Azula style, she smiled. Kuzan, you should be more careful when you speak. Not everyone is as benevolent as me. Though she said it like that anyone with half a brain would be able to tell that she was threatening him. Especially since the blue fire covering her hand hasn't calmed down at all. Sokka ignored all that and just looked towards Tai Lee with a smile on his face. Hello there, my name is Kuzan, nice to meet you. Though the person in front of her felt somewhat strange, she wasn't someone who would judge them just based on that. So Tai Lee waved at him in her usual energetic way. Ash Sokka POV. This girl is sharp. Tai Lee always seemed kind of like a dumb girl in the show. But by the way, she was acting. I could tell that she was a little cautious. Usually, she would be more energetic and even hug people, yet she hasn't offered even a handshake. Also, when our eyes meet she looks away. Now she either has a crush or is cautious of me. I am more inclined to believe the latter because we just met. Still, there must be a logical reason why she is suspicious. Many thoughts and facts went through my mind about Tai Lee. Due to increasing my intelligence, I could remember things a little better. So there was one obscure fact that came to mind. She could sense auras. I think she was able to read my mood. Oh, now I understood what she was so cautious of. Due to Gamer's mind my aura is probably like stone, always calm. And that skill might even stop her from seeing anything at all. Yeah, I can use something similar too, like observe, and suddenly something strange was said on the observe panel then I would be suspicious too. Due to understanding and comprehending someone's actions and behavior, your wisdom increased by one. I am getting the hang of this thing. It was not a good thing to waste stats on intelligence and wisdom. Because that didn't make you smart or wise, just gave you empty capacity for them. One becomes wiser through life experiences and smarter by studying. If someone increases their intelligence by using stats, I wouldn't call them smart. Sure, they might have the capacity to be. But even in the game of Manwa, the main character wasn't smart. A calculator without a user was just a piece of junk. Well, that was the way I saw things at least. It doesn't necessarily make them true just because I think so. But at least that was the understanding I had of the situation. So with all of that in mind, I tried to cook up a plan that would fix the problem between me and Tylee. While it was unexpected, it was better to mend these things than let them evolve into something worse. Anyway, Azela, do we involve her in our liar game? I asked her. She looked at me coldly, and that was enough of an answer. Well, when do we get back? I have another trick I want to teach you. Sure, she nodded, and I could see the excitement in her eyes. Essentially, I had become YouTube for her. Very addictive if you spend too much time on it researching and learning useless things that you will forget soon. She turned towards Ty Lee, and with a fiery look in her eyes asked again. Do you want to join me in capturing the avatar? Azula that's threatening. Sigh. She didn't listen at all to what I was trying to teach her. 
Oh well, sometimes it requires listening to the same thing more than once to understand it. Things like these would add up. It's no wonder in the original story Ty Lee ended up betraying her. The walk back to the ship was awkwardly silent. Hey, guys, is the ship cool? Asked Ty Lee, trying to add some conversation. The silence that followed made even me get second-hand embarrassment from her. Jeez, this is awkward. I better start fixing this before the relationships turn sour. Azala was all serious and didn't seem angry at me but she probably was. A princess who always has everyone listen to her, she needed to learn how to stop believing that titles give you power. Well, she will have to learn about it eventually. But how do I make her understand? She was at that age where she didn't know what to do with her life, and would follow what Ozai told her. What does Azla want? I had no idea what she wanted. That was something she had to discover by herself. So, why would Azla choose you, Tylee? Sokka wondered, knowing the answer already but deciding to start a conversation this way. She is strong and someone I can trust to be competent. Azula was the one to answer that. Are you still mad? He asked jokingly. But she didn't answer. But Sokka didn't mind that and continued. Do you know that everyone lives a life wearing masks without knowing? It's quite an amazing concept. We are going to spar a little when we go to the ship if you are going to be traveling with us. I need to make sure that you are strong enough to keep up. Azula stated. Her eyes were sharp like a knife as she looked at him. I thought you wouldn't have to lie to me by now. So how about you tell me the truth? Sokka requested calmly. He understood that Azula wasn't someone who would need to hide her intentions from him, as he would be able to see through her. Ty Lee wanted to stop them from fighting, as she felt like this was her fault as it all started with Kuzan standing up for her. But she knew that no matter what she said, it was too late to stop Azula. She felt kind of bad for feeling so suspicious of him, but she couldn't get rid of this instinct of hers. That said that there was more than seen to it to him. I want to destroy you, Azula said, her eyes seeming to ignite into a dangerous fire. I will crush and show you where you belong, beneath my feet. As she said that Azula glanced at Kuzan, trying to peek at what his face looked like. Was he nervous? Or fearless like always? But unexpectedly, he had a look on his face as if he just swallowed a lemon, which slowly developed into an amused smile. You are into those kinds of things. Well, it shouldn't come as a surprise, it suits you. This confused her, while Ty Lee seemed to get what he meant and blushed, covering her face in shame. Huh? Azala frowned, annoyed that she didn't understand something. Sokka chuckled. You are more pure-minded than I thought too. He then stopped, thinking of how to explain it to her, and continued. But what I mean by it is, for example, you want to crush, destroy, and dominate me, right? Obviously she still didn't understand what he meant like this. To Azula, crushing, dominating, and destroying the enemy was something she had been training and learning since childhood. I still don't see what you find funny. She glanced at Ty Lee. Also why are you embarrassed? A dash, ah, uh, n dash nothing. Ty Lee tried to change the situation, not wanting to answer such a question. But she failed terribly, and it made Azula even more curious. It seems like our innocent circus girl knows a lot more than she lets on. Wonder what book she read it from. I still don't quite see what makes this funny for you and embarrassing for her, Azula insisted, irritated at not getting an answer. Sokka felt like someone who would have to give the whole birds and bees talk to a girl like her. He wasn't the right person to have that conversation with. But he was also amused just how naive Azula was about these things, and a large smile, filled with mischievous thoughts, appeared on his face. Well, my dear friend Azula, let me introduce you to the world of S and M. Ty Lee tried walking slower than them, so she would stay behind and stay with the guards, just outside of earshot. But Sokka grabbed her hand and put an arm around the pretty circus girl. Where do you think you are going? I want to hear how you learn of this too. This world had no internet, but it had quite some explicit books. So he wanted to hear some juicy stories. His love for drama and embarrassing stories was lit within his heart. The spa that he would have with Azula went to the back of his mind as he was more concentrated on something else. Now, let me show you the world of S and M. I think someone like Azula should like it. First, let's start with Dashding. New quest teach Azula about S and M. The princess of the Fire Nation grew up isolated and always alone. Introduce her to concepts from the outside world. Objective 1 explain to Azula about S and M. Objective 2 embarrass Ty Lee. Objective 3 make Ty Lee. Tell her story about where she learned of this. Rewards. Unknown experience points with a pain gag of quietness blindfold of darkness. Sokka just stared at the rewards displayed in front of him. He didn't know if he wanted a quest like this. Because the rewards were weird. The only reason he was doing this was to entertain himself and get closer to Azula. So with that in mind, he dismissed the gamer interface panel. And continued what he would have done anyway. Azula was left embarrassed, and Ty Lee wasn't far from it either, as she explained how she accidentally got a book from one of the other female circus members. She held onto it and never returned it. So yeah, that's the general gist of it, Sokka said with a proud smirk. Quest completed rewards have been deposited in your inventory. He ignored the notification and continued talking. By the way, Ty Lee, do you still have that book? Yes, she answered softly. Well, we are gonna read it together. Such debauchery, people enjoying pain. That's stupid to Azula, it felt weird and unnatural that people enjoyed things like that. Kuzan, 
How do you know this? He had been asking Tai Li and teasing her for so long. But as they arrived at the docks, Sokka decided to change the subject and point at it. Oh, look, it's the ship. We should go and spar now. This made Azula narrow her eyes. You are going to tell me that. After making us like this, the least you can do is tell us a little about yourself. That wording is horrible, Sokka muttered, just out of Azula's hearing. But Tai Li heard it, and contemplated her friend's words once again, and it made her chuckle. Well, do you want to lie or the truth? The truth, obviously, Azula said as if it was obvious. I had a girlfriend that was into it, she was masochistic, though not to an excessive degree. She even taught me how to choke someone without leaving marks. Wanna try that Azula? He asked jokingly. Do that and I will burn your hands off, she answered simply. As they walked into the ship, Azula wasn't angry anymore, and Tylee seemed amused by some of the ridiculous stories Sokka told. By now, no one cared about the spa, but Azula still insisted on holding it. Sokka requested a week break if he won. She accepted such conditions due to being confident in winning. As the sun was setting, Azula was in her normal armor, while Sokka stood opposite of her with a spear in hand. Tai Li was by the side and didn't know who to cheer for, as she too had gotten closer to them both, and knew that Kuzan was a good guy. Sokka was unbothered by this and looked at Azula. So, how do we decide the winner? It will become apparent when the winner wins. She took a deep breath and shot out a dozen blasts of fire in his direction. He looked at the flames heading towards him with a dismissive gaze, and tilted his head to the side slightly, just enough to dodge the flame and its heat damage. Though as he had expected, the blue fire felt hotter than normal. You truly are a genius firebender. Though he said that with a sincere voice. The casualness that he dodged the flames with made it seem like he wasn't telling the truth. But in reality, the reason Sokka was so casual was that by now he had fought monsters. While Azula was agile and quite close to his level of speed, in comparison to the Nemean lion she was slow. Seeing this, Azula closed the distance, normally doing so against a spear user would be their weakness. But Sokka countered her style by dodging point-blank fires and getting out of the way of the blast in just the right moment. He was using this as a leveling experience for his danger sense skill. That can't be leveled up in normal sparing. Because the sparring opponent wouldn't want to hurt him, but Azula did. She was giving it her all. But each blast of fire met empty air, and by now she realized that he hadn't used his spear. When within such close distance he could have used it to hit her. Azula was betting on the first hit landing, and when it didn't, she knew that Kuzan would go on the counterattack. But now, she could see that things had changed. The dynamic of completely overwhelming her opponents had shifted. Kuzan had a nonchalant look that seemed almost bored. This enraged Azula, which made her come up with a new idea. Because as he dodged the next blast of fire, his body was left in a strange position. She opened her mouth and blew out a fire breath. This was the first time she had done something like this, but it worked, showing just how talented she was and how strong her understanding of firebending stood. Even Sokka was a little surprised by such an attack, but he had expected something unexpected from Azula. He had thought that the breathing flames out of their mouth was more down Iroh's alley. But still, he dodged the attack by barely crouching out of the way. Azula then changed her direction and blew fire downward by looking at him. Seeing this, Sokka frowned. Normally he would have used his palm to hit her lower jaw and shut her mouth, causing the fire to blast on her face, killing her, and at best disfiguring her horribly. But he kept himself from doing that, and instead used his spear to trip Azula and jump back, while the spear burned due to being within the radius of the flames being breathed out by her. Sokka didn't mind and just rushed. Azula used the momentum of her fall to go into a one-handed handstand and blast fire with her feet, causing Sokka to jump back again. Be careful next time. I could have used the palm of my hand to shut your mouth while you were breathing fire. I don't think either of us would want that. So next time you do something like it, remember, enemies won't hold back. Sokka warned her, and as the image of what would happen in that scenario came to Azula's mind, she winced. Thanks, she whispered, so low that even Sokka was unable to hear her. Right now, she was pushed to the corner and planned to use lightning. But stopping herself for the first time in her life, Azula showed mercy to an opponent. She didn't think Sokka could dodge lightning, no matter how fast he was. So instead, since he had spared her, she put her guard down and looked him in the eyes. Her gaze was as cold as always. It's your win this time. She knew that some of the guards heard her, and this would lower her power within her crew. But she didn't want to hurt someone like Sokka he was more useful than her honor. At least that was what she told herself. Ash Sokka POV. Did the usually driven and cruel Azula just compromise, willing to give up some of her reputation for this? I don't think Ozai will like this when it reaches his ears. Well, if she was willing to do this much for me, I will do the same for her. So with a smile on my face, I respectfully clasped my hands. So any guard that saw us would see that Azula was still in charge. I didn't want to usurp her authority. Thanks for your kindness, Azula. I know the royal family can use lightning. Someone like you must be extra good at it too. So, thanks for not using it. 
That thing is dangerous for a simple spa. She stared at me curiously at first, but then smiled. Yes, you should be thankful. Ah, so she caught on to what I was doing. This girl was smart, at such a young age being able to read such political power moves. Well, our friendship was now fixed and had grown even stronger. She should understand by now that I wasn't here to usurp her, and my opinions are only what I think, and that I have her best interests in mind. Sure, you can go and have your one week break. Meet us in a mashu after this is all over. Azala ordered as if I was a subordinate, but the look on her face said something different. Do you need any guards? No, I am quite good by myself. They would just slow me down. With that said, I walked out of the ship. Leaving some of my stuff behind wouldn't make her think that I was leaving her. Though my important stuff was in the inventory she didn't need to know that. So with that said, he went and jumped off the ship and swam to shore. Azala frowned. He didn't even ask for food or money. Ty Lee rushed Azala and hugged her. Glad that the spa didn't develop into a real fight. Come on Azale, you are worried about him, right? Will he eat enough? Is he cold? The answer she got was in the form of Azale lighting up a fire in her hand and bringing it close to her friend. I am joking, joking, Ty Lee said, but her demeanor didn't show any regret as she kept rubbing her cheek against Azala's. She was glad that she saw an aura around her friend that Ty Lee never thought she would see. Katara with Kiwi on her shoulder went to gather some water for the group. As a waterbender, she could carry the water easily, so she was the most efficient choice to do so. The cute fox was a nice addition that kept her company during such short trips and would always protect her friend no matter what even though it was so small. Kiwi, do you want some sugarcane? She asked the little fox, noticing that there was a lot of sugarcane around them. Katara didn't know exactly what foxes ate, but tried to offer Kiwi any edible things that she could think of. The little fox was smart enough to know what she could eat and what not to eat. Kiwi shook her head and rubbed her cheek against Katara, making the young waterbender chuckle. Come on now, Kiwi. Don't be so cute sister, don't spoil her too much. I wouldn't want emergency food number two to become spoiled. Sokka's voice sounded out as Katara looked around but couldn't see him. Up here, she looked up and saw him hanging by a branch with one hand while on the other, he had a big fish in a hook. I caught us some dinner too. So emergency food number two lives another day. Hey, I told you not to call her that in front of Kiwi. She pouted while comforting the little fox. Also I don't spoil her too much. Sokka stared at his sister with a suspicious look, but didn't say anything. They both knew she spoiled the little fox too much. Suddenly he chuckled at the situation and she did too. As long as Kiwi was around, Sokka knew that Katara would be safe. Because the little fox was technically a strong spirit, though it was too young. Ash Sokka POV I had dismissed my clone and decided to meet with Katara. Since my water clone was close to the river, he was probably catching some fish as that was my job. So when I showed up with fish, Katara went along with it too. Every time I dismissed the clone, I made sure he went swimming into the water and then dismissed it just in case someone I couldn't detect by using map was around. Well, if my clone hadn't gone fishing, then the situation would have been weird, as I now had a big fish in my hand out of nowhere. I was okay with that kind of development too. Just thinking of the look on Katara's face makes me want to do it. Damn, if only there wasn't a war going on, I would have spent more time with my little sister. Also had some fun and enjoyed a whole new world. We went back and Arn was there, gathering some plants and ready to make some soup for himself. Wow, that's a big fish. Your fishing feels like it's getting better every day uncommented, and he wasn't wrong as my fishing skill does continue to level up at a steady pace. Though it was mostly due to luck because no matter how good of a fisherman someone was, sometimes without luck, you won't catch anything. I started a fire by using some flint and started cooking. Yes, I know. You are still free to join my meat-eating ways. Arn chuckled. No, no, I will follow my monk-like ways. You are free to join me, Sokka. That was when I noticed Katara's necklace on the ground. This girl needs to be more careful with things like these. I crouched down, picking it up. Hey sis, don't leave these things on the ground, or I might step on them. Possibly with the intention to make you angry. Katara saw that and went to grab her necklace. But I raised my hand, and she wasn't able to reach it. Let me make sure that it's tied on correctly. Having the necklace lost somewhere, and then a certain monster that can track others by scent find her, was the last thing I wanted to worry about. She sighs and pulls up her hair, showing me her neck. I put her necklace on and make sure to tie it up correctly. This way it shouldn't fall out. Well to me, this was just a piece of junk. Sometimes people risk their lives for things that can connect them to their loved ones. I wouldn't blame Katara if she did something stupid as it was normal. But that didn't mean that I couldn't try and prevent certain things and unnecessary drama. It looks good on you. Aung complimented her, trying to get on my sister's good side. Well, Katara would refuse. But it's time I added a little more fuel to the fire. Our young love Aung blushed in embarrassment as expected. But Katara was different, there wasn't even a speck of embarrassment on her. She just chuckled. Sokka, don't joke around like that. Aung is like a good friend and little brother to me. 
I saw the mighty Avatar crumble and look down, his mood spiraling downward like a meteor, due to the words he hears. Like always, little sis was out there going for the KO. He is like Momo, or Kiwi, Katara pointed at the aforementioned animals. That was too far. I feel like I could see Ahn's spirit floating to the afterlife. Now, I even feel sorry for him. That's why you shouldn't put hopes in one-sided love Ahn, because you will end up crushed. As an older brother, I would normally kick to the ground any guy that might get close to my little sister. That's my job. But Arn, he was a kid in my eyes, and just got handed the worst beat down in his life. So as a good friend, I went to him and put my arm around his shoulder. How about we go and get resupplied in the nearby village? Maybe this way I might get Arn to meet some new girl to get a crush on before Katara crushes the poor guy's self-confidence. He is 12, it takes a lot of courage to say anything to a girl at that age. I am coming along, said Katara happily not having noticed the emotional damage she had done. She was a cold and cruel emotionless killer. Okay, maybe I was exaggerating a little about her, but Arn was going there to recover. Well, hopefully, she doesn't say anything. But I couldn't say no to my little sister. Arn was a good friend, but Katara was family. It is pretty obvious who I would choose between them. As they walked to a nearby village, they came into a place that had settled close to a volcano. So what are we missing? Salt. Spices. Inquired Katara, trying to be the responsible sister, like always. Well, nothing was missing, and we wouldn't need to even come here normally. But Arn needed to get his head straight, and not worry about such things. Though the volcano close by was about to explode, saving these ignorant people from a burning and painful death, sounded like a good idea. Why were they ignorant? Because they decided to believe a fortune teller whether the volcano would explode or not. There were a lot of stupid people out there in the world, and sometimes deaths like these were a cruel, but natural selection. But since there were children in that village too, I decided to help. Plus it would raise the Avatar's prestige and gather more soldiers for a cause. Just imagine, the Avatar fighting against a volcano. That sounded very endearing which would cause many people to join our calls. Well, this was a boring thing to think about, but necessary. People's minds were complex, and they needed a cause to believe in. Arn was a 12-year-old, and whether he was the Avatar or not, most people wouldn't follow him. He failed them once and would do so again. Also, Arn was soft-spoken, awkward and a pacifist pretty much. He was the worst kind of a person you would want to take the side of in a war. So I had to compensate for his weaknesses. Complaining about his weakness, or trying to twist Arn's personality to be more warlike, would be useless. Also, pacifist leaders use usually thrive during times of peace, so that was a positive. Didn't you hear about Aunt Wu's foreign telling about another marriage today? Yeah, that seems to be happening a lot lately. This village is blessed to have someone like Aunt Wu amongst us. The people around us spoke about Aunt Wu with a revenant voice, as if she could predict the future. At best she could give vague statements, which pretty much anyone could do. Katara had an excited smile on her face. Kandash sure. I could guess what Katara was going to say. Of course, someone her age would want to know her future. Let's go and falsely get her fates read. While I wasn't going to refute the existence of fate readers, since my existence alone proved that there were things beyond my understanding for now. So being completely dismissive of a fate reading ability would be something short-sighted. But that didn't mean that I would believe any old granny that came around and said that they could tell me my future. In reality, fates shouldn't even be known to the user because sometimes just knowing the fate would make it set in stone. Like Oedipus, when his father banished him after learning that his son would kill him and marry his wife, his mother. He had the kid banished as an infant and that inevitably led him to fulfill the prophecy without even meaning to. Then there was the kind of future sight that just knowing about it and the knowledge of what it held would cause the future to change. This was my kind of future vision, because even if I had tried to act exactly like Sokka, eventually small things would have spiraled out of control and caused a change. Sokka, Katara, and Arn went to the fortune teller, where a young girl, Meng came out to greet them with a smile on her face. She was young and had two braids to her dark hair. Welcome, Aunt Wu has been expecting you. From what Sokka remembered, she was Aunt Wu's assistant and someone who would grow to have a crush on Aunt. Sokka, as a self-proclaimed love guru, caught this and looked at the two like a hungry tiger. Katara brought him out of his thoughts by punching him to the side. Don't look at them like that. It will scare the young girl. He pouted. But it looks like fun. By now, Katara had come to learn a little more about her brother. A side that she never knew would exist within him. His love for drama. Whether it was an extramarital affair, family matters, drama, relationships, Sokka would always get himself into a position with one of the main culprits of the drama, and put himself in the perfect position to watch the show. While it wasn't immoral to do so, Katara considered his actions a little too invasive. What do you think will happen with her? Arn won't take her on the journey with us, since she is normal, and that would cause her to be hurt. Maybe they will fall in love, and once he comes back she will have already forgotten about him, and found a new boyfriend. Sokka whispered what might happen in the future to Katara. And while she was interested, the stories he said were entertaining. At the same time, she didn't want to have her mind tainted by her brother. Don't say such harsh things, Arn is your friend, she whispered back at Sokka harshly. But come on this is a good drama. Also, I will help Arn get another girl if he is ever single, he muttered trying to come up with an excuse for his actions. 
They were escorted into a room, while Katara and Sokka continued whispering amongst each other. At the same time, the other girl tried to make moves on Aan, who seemed to not even notice them. Aunt Wu came forward, she was an old woman, but not old enough to be considered elderly. Sokka would assume that she was around her 60s, and quite rich too, due to the clothes she wore, and the expensive looking rings on her fingers. She must have scammed a lot of people in this small village to be able to get so rich in such a remote place. Ash Sokka contemplated, but didn't say anything out loud. The first one Aunt Wu looked at was Katara. What are you gonna ask me, dear? About who you will marry? How many children will you have? Or maybe some other boring question. It seemed like the old woman was already bored, and seemed to predict Katara's question without her even saying anything. While this seemed to impress others, Sokka wasn't that impressed, but disappointed instead. At that moment, he knew that she was a fake. While even she might believe in her methods, without a doubt. Aunt Wu was a fake. If she was a fake reader, she would have said something more concrete, something that only Katara knew. But instead, she said something obvious to Sokka, which undoubtedly any girl Katara's age would ask. So seeing this, as they were all already sitting down, Sokka lay back into the ground with his hands behind his head. The initial interest that he had was now all lost. Instead, now he was more concerned with the volcano, and tried to think of a plan on how to fight against it. At the same time, on a port of an Earth Kingdom colony, Azala and Ty Lee stepped off the ship. They were going to meet another one of their friends. When Ty Lee got a curious thoughtful look on her face, and without thinking much, wondered out loud, Why do you think Kuzan got this break? Does he have a secret girlfriend maybe? Azala stopped walking once she heard that. Only then did Ty Lee realize, she said that out loud. Oops I mean he probably doesn't right? Aunt Wu narrowed her eyes as she glanced at Sokka. Seeing the young man act so uninterested, made it clear that he didn't believe in her ability. But that didn't bother her because Aunt Wu knew her ability to predict the future was right and very accurate. She had learned and catalogued everything that would show her the future and what it meant. As the world's best future reader, Aunt Wu felt quite proud of the ability she had spent so much time trying to perfect. If you don't want to be here, no one's forcing you to stay. He shrugged. Sorry if I sent the wrong message. I am just waiting for my sister to get her future read. I meant no disrespect to you in any way. I'm just very tired due to the journey. Aunt Wu didn't say anything and just stared at him for around a dozen seconds before turning back to Katara. Sokka, though he glanced at her every now and then, could see that Aunt Wu was just waiting for him to say something. She was already ready to get into an argument with him. But in the end, Sokka didn't like arguing with delusional people. In his eyes, Aunt Wu was just like that, someone with no such thing as the ability to read someone's future. Seeing the patience of the young man, Aunt Wu too, decided to drop the matter and not pick a fight here. So, what was your question again, young girl? Katara excitedly smiled and said, Who will I marry? Aunt Wu almost sighs and boredom at such a simple question. But that would be unprofessional, and she didn't want to give Sokka a reason to hate her. Just by the look in his eyes, she could tell that he was very protective of his little sister. Come to my room. I will tell you. Aunt Wu mentioned with her hand for Katara to follow. Sokka was calm, outwardly, but internally he was fuming. He didn't want Katara's mind to be poisoned by thoughts of the future. Thinking about the future too much would make someone forget to live in the present. Since she was at a young and impressionable age, Katara was quite open-minded at things like this. So Sokka was worried that his sister might get too addicted to these fate-predicting things. The feeling of knowing the future can be quite intoxicating. Worse than any drug, Katara and Wu enter her room, and the young waterbender looks around in curiosity. There were many things in here, but quite a lot less than expected. There was a low-hanging table in the room, so they had to sit on the floor. Aunt Wu seemed to think and gazed at the items around her room. They all seemed like things that one would predict the future with. In the end, she chooses a deck of cards, and puts them all face down on the table. Pick two of them. Katara was nervous and took a deep breath picking one and flipping it over. It was a crude drawing of a man standing on the moon. What does this mean? Your love will be a great bender. You will be a lonely man who likes standing in the world with his own two feet, the elderly woman explained with a frown. This was a rare card to pull and not many in the village had been able to do so. Aunt Wu could see that Katara was dissatisfied and with a sigh, decided to let her pull another one. Do one more. The next card Katara pulled over showed a man with two swords in his hand and a spear on the ground. Aunt Wu glanced at the card with a surprised look on her face. Oh, this is quite surprising. He will be a great warrior too. Pulling those two cards together usually means that your love is some great general, commander, or a weapons master. Katara was still curious as this said nothing about when she would meet her destined love or anything like that. For a girl her age, it was quite normal to be impatient. But Aunt Wu knew that the third card would be one that revealed a bad trait about their future love. During this reading, she could pull out five cards. But the third, fourth, and fifth revealed bad or horrendous things. So it was better to not know about them at all. But without Aunt Wu even looking, Katara went and flipped the third card. Before the fate reader could stop her, it showed a woman clutching at her heart while kneeling on the ground with tears in her eyes. 
While a man walked away emotionlessly, this is the card of heartbreak and unrequited love. The man she will fall in love with won't return her feelings. Ash Ong Wu felt a little pity towards Katara and smiled sadly. He will be involved in a huge war with the possibility of death. She didn't say anything about what she saw, and instead decided to not crush the young girl's dreams. Still, she said something bad so at least there was still some hope. Sometimes people had to take fate into their own hands and build it themselves. Anyway, that's it now, go and bring on the next customers. The one with the arrow tattoos on his body. Aunt Wu advised Katara while showing her away. As she left, Aunt Wu looked at the cards curiously. Seriously. She pulled another card to see how Katara's future love might be, and saw that it was a man with a mask. He had a frowny mask on his face, while holding another mask with a smile on his face. She really is unlucky, that girl. As Katara walked out, she was annoyed at what she had just heard, and it was apparent on her face. At least it seemed so to Sokka, who kept staring at her with a nonchalant look while munching on some crackers. Hum troubles in love town. She manipulated the tea on the cup in front of him to hit his face, and it did so. Hey, that could have been hot tea. You don't like your tea too hot, and there was no steam coming out of it. So stop being a baby, Katara reasoned, and this distracted her from the prediction she just got. Ash Sokka POV I decided to let her hit me in the face with the tea. This was so my naive little sister would finally stop worrying about such things as the future. People make their own fate, and knowledge of the future doesn't mean that it makes it set in stone. Especially with such a bad fate reader. Arm looked a little down from what he had just heard. Hum. Did Katara's fate reading involve more than the original timeline? Oh well, it doesn't matter. Damn, this place just brought down the morale of both Arn and Katara. Well, the Eben the kinder got what he had coming to him, since he was peeking in during Katara's fake reading. After Ahn goes to Aunt Wu, I decided to console my sister and put an arm around her, rubbing my cheek that was drenched in tea against her cheek. Normally this would be nice, except the sugary tea that would make her face all sticky. Sokka. She yelled out, annoyed. Well better be annoyed than sad. Ah, the trouble I go to for my sibling, and she will never know this. Arm comes back and he is disappointed. Damn, this place sucks. So what did you get? I asked him, and before he could answer I gave him my prediction. I bet she said something like, you will fight in a war that will decide the fate of the world. Huh, how did you know? He got a confused look on his face. That's what she said, though aren't we used different words, saying that I will be involved in a great battle between the forces of good and evil, which will determine the fate of the whole world. Sokka chuckled, having already predicted this. Well, let's get out of here then. You aren't going to aren't Wu. Don't you want to know your future? Inquired Ahn, surprised at Sokka's decision. Huh. I don't trust someone else telling me my future. I stated, looking at the avatar intently. The only one who decides my fate is me. Also, Aunt Wu was a sham, so I wouldn't believe whatever crap comes out of her mouth anyway. Since she knew that Aunt was the avatar, anyone could have concluded that he would be fighting in a war that will decide the fate of the world. Well, it's time I put my chance to work and distract these two knuckleheads from what they heard. Sokka ruffled his sister's hair and said, don't worry Katara. Whatever you heard from her, it probably doesn't mean anything. At first, she didn't pay attention to him and just stared at the ground, which made him ruffle her hair even harder, messing it all up to the point that it annoyed her. Suddenly the villagers started gathering towards the center of the village. Sokka saw this, and his eyes turned cold for a split second. But then he was back to all smiles and acting like his usual self. He went towards one of the villagers and asked them, Excuse me. But why is everyone gathering towards the center of the village? Is it some kind of festival? The man in question smiled back at the friendly looking soccer. His smile was contagious. Yes, Aunt Wu will read the clouds and read the fate of the village. Thanks, this could be a once in a lifetime opportunity for us. Sokka smiled in excitement, which made the villager men even happier, as sometimes outsiders would act rude and doubt Aunt Wu's predictions. But as Sokka turned around the excitement slipped out of him. He knew that even if he saved them today, their people were naive and couldn't be saved from their stupidity. Their belief in Aunt Wu's predictions was absolute. Sokka contemplated just leaving this village to their demise. There wasn't anything beneficial from it. Sometimes events like this were just survival of the fittest. Mother Nature eliminates those unfit to live. That was the natural law of the world. But as Sokka saw children running happily while holding their parents' hands, he sighed, children had no sin, and images of them burning on lava wasn't something he wanted in his memory. So with a sigh, he decided, well, time to fight against the volcano. Ding. You have got a new quest new quest save. The village Mapaku village is about to be destroyed by molten lava. Save it from its demise. Rewards. 40,000 experience points, killer of queens, unknown snakeskin. Sokka accepted the mission, there was no reason to refuse. So he accepted it and kept staring, as Aunt Wu came to the highlighted stage and read the clouds. The villagers cheered as the message was positive, saying that the village wouldn't be destroyed by the volcano, and that the harvest will be good. As always, Sokka sighed in disappointment. From what he had seen so far, Aunt Wu seemed to believe in her fate reading. This was a lot more dangerous than being a normal scammer. 
Vague phrases and promises were words that he wouldn't trust from someone like her. Seeing the cheering people, Sokka doesn't say anything and just observes. His eyes were like that of a hawk observing everything around him. This village couldn't be saved from its naivety. No matter how he looked at the situation, he simply couldn't help someone who didn't want to be helped. In the end, he strolled through the market while Aang and Katara were practicing waterbending close by. Keely and Momo were with them too. Sokka looked through the stalls trying to find anything worth it. He had invested quite a lot in luck, so he hoped to be able to find a hidden treasure in a junk store for cheap. He traveled through many stores and bought some things that caught his eye, putting them in his inventory. Coal encrusted diamond, a rock that has golden coins hidden in it, earthbending scroll. He picked these things because he saw value in them. Though the latter was useless for him, Sokka, just to test it, tried to learn the earthbending scroll as the notification to learn it appeared. Error. You have no relation with any earthbender in your family. You haven't been granted earthbending from the unknown unknown. You also don't have unknown or unknown to learn multiple bendings. As he had expected, it wasn't possible for now to learn multiple bendings. While the gamer interface could push the limits of what it meant to be human, it still wasn't able to destroy those limits. Still, finding any bending scroll was hard. In rural parts like these, finding one in a shop so cheap was impossible almost impossible. As evening came about, Sokka went all over the village and bought barrels. He assumed different identities by using the transformation jutsu. This way he wouldn't draw suspicion, even if he did, they weren't used for anything big, so no one would care. He approached a water stream, that was almost big enough to be a river, and took out a bunch of the barrels he had brought with him. Ash Soccer POV. Where is my heaven-defying treasure? I put all of those status points into luck. Just what kind of luck did those MC have that found heaven-defying treasures in each corner shop? It made a guy like me feel unfortunate, and I just found a diamond big enough, that if I sold it, the wealth would last two to three generations of my family, even if they spend it lavishly. But still, I will have to keep trying harder and find a heaven-defying treasure. Though it might be mostly because this world had nothing like that, maybe the best I could hope for is a weapon with a spirit sealed inside of it. Even then, I don't think spirits here work like that. After filling the barrels with water from a water stream, I put them in my inventory and casually walked back. The volcano should explode soon. While I didn't know the exact time, fighting against a volcano was something I wouldn't be able to normally do. Going in unprepared would end up with dying a horrible death, no matter how much luck I had. Also, there was one thing most people forget to look out for when fighting something so formidable. They forget to look after their back. While fighting in a dangerous battle against a volcano, Abadaroku met his death that way. I don't want to be as naive as him and believe in friendship. That got him killed. First and foremost, I must convince Katara and Aang to not become entranced by Aunt Wu's predictions. They were useless. My naive little sister already seems to be too involved with them, looking around trying to find her love. Even without listening in, I knew what she probably told Katara. Something like her future love would be a great bender. No, since Aung seemed disappointed. She probably said something like a great warrior, or maybe both. Things like a good leader, warrior, or bender can mean too many things and are vague. For example, a good leader can mean from a village elder who was kind to their people to a great general that changed the world. Your intelligence has increased by one for guessing the most likely scenario. Walking back, many thoughts went through my mind. But in the end, I had already made my decision and didn't plan to change my mind now. I saw Katara drinking some strange concoction. I think it was some juice special to the local area. Walking toward her, I grasped the top of her head and ruffled the hair under my hand. Sister, you must be quite stupid and naive. What? She frowned, looking at me with sharp, dagger-like eyes. That was quite a ferocious look she had there. It almost made me proud. Sometimes in life, you have to be a lion to be the lamb you really are. My duty as a brother was to teach Katara how to keep her claws sharp. Life was always a fight, and even if she gives up, I will be there to catch her. But I can't make her fight again. So that indomitable will wasn't something I could give her. Kiwi looked on at him with an innocent look in its eyes. I peered at the small creature and picked it up from Katara's shoulder and put it on top of my head. The small fox buried her head in my hair. Hey, don't be mean to Kiwi. Katara pouted, knowing how I usually acted with the small spirit. The little fox might get killed here, so it was better if it stayed with me during this. Yeah, yeah. I waved her off. Anyway, we should go and check up on the volcano. I could see that Katara was about to say something, but she nodded. Good, she didn't say something stupid. While I could afford to babysit her for now, that wouldn't be so in the future. So she better learn these lessons well. I went and got on too, who was trying to learn how to use a sword. I was not gonna bother and even get into that situation. It sounded too troublesome. We all settled on Appa and went to check the volcano. As expected, the volcano was like bubbling soup and seemed about to burst. Even as we sat atop Appa, I could feel the heat land on my skin. This was hotter than I thought it would feel. Weapons were essentially useless scraps against a volcano, only bending would help somewhat. No way, Katara exclaimed in shock. 
The villagers could die if they don't evacuate. Told you the fate reading was a sham. Just overly ambiguous sayings that can be interpreted in many ways. I clarified, breaking my little sister off the hope she had. Well, she was at the age where she would believe in things like this. It's the equivalent of a teenage girl who believes in horoscopes. Sadly, this was a harsh lesson that needed to be taught before she grew up keeping to those beliefs. We need to go and warn the villagers. Um, reasoned, interrupting me out of my thoughts. Appa, yip yip. The sky bison went and flew back toward the village. The wind hitting my face started getting hotter. It seemed like it wouldn't be long until the volcano bursts. As we landed, Arn hurriedly jumped down, using his airbending to soften the landing. He was in the middle of the market on a busy street for a village that is. Everyone, the volcano, it's going to erupt soon. We need to evacuate. The people stopped for a second, looking at Arn as if he was crazy, and they went on to do their daily tasks. What a crazy guy. Isn't that the avatar? Avatar or whatever, Aunt Wu's predictions aren't wrong. Yeah! And our village has never been protected by the Avatar. But Aunt Wu has helped us many times. Arn could do nothing but look on in despair, as no one believed him. So, seeing this, Arn turned around and looked at Sokka, jumping up. He glided back into the floating Appa's back, and looked at Sokka with a pleading gaze. Use your words. I know you can convince them like you always do with everyone. Just like you became friends with the Amashi guards. Sokka shook his head. My words aren't something magical. He knew first and foremost that the people wouldn't listen. What Sokka was looking for here wasn't just the short-sighted vision of saving the village. Because the words Aunt Wu said during the prediction said that the village wouldn't be destroyed. If they saved the village, then it would simply make her prediction correct. Because she never said explicitly that the volcano wouldn't explode. Yes, wording like this was what made Aunt Wu a successful fate reader. But Sokka getting with him in a battle of words. If he knew one thing... It was scammer-like sayings and words. Arn slumped, not knowing what to say next. But Sokka only put a hand on his friend's shoulder and said, Let's get ready to fight a volcano. While both Katara and Arn were panicking in this situation. But Sokka was calm. No thoughts intruded his mind other than how to deal with the situation at hand. As evening came about and the villagers were about to go to sleep, something unexpected happened. It was something that they hadn't worried about until now. Boom. The hallowing noise of the volcano erupting rang out, and the sky turned red as molten lava flew down from the mountain like a tsunami. The villagers looked on in despair as they had nothing, no plan, nor any defenses to protect themselves. A burst of hit air came before the lava did, and it filled everyone's lungs with heat. This caused some to start heavily coughing. As the volcano started flowing, Sokka immediately went towards the civilians, most were frozen in fear and shock. Everyone, move it. Earthbenders, create walls. Don't grab anything, just run. That simple shout woke them up, and people started running in the opposite direction. While the earthbenders made walls, he ordered them where to make canals. Sokka made sure to instruct the panicked men clearly, so they didn't mess up. Arm, on the other hand, stared at the rushing lava fearfully and swallowed, but he took a deep breath to calm himself. Sokka had told him the plan, and it was to try and hold out as long as they could, so the civilians could escape. Katara was there to help him too, but she was even less confident in being able to do much here, because she had very little water to work with, and the village well was nowhere near enough water to stop a volcano either. Soon, the lava came as a tidal wave, and Arn immediately used his airbending to cool off heaps of lava. Earthbenders stood atop the village walls, creating canals and trying to redirect the lava away. Katara too had been able to help more than she thought, because as Sokka instructed her, she was able to catch any fire debris with water, and stop it from hitting the villagers. Sokka on the other hand instructed and gathered the villagers in one place, leading the earthbenders to raise a platform higher than the walls, and that it would lift all of the villagers. The shape of the platform was like that of a triangle, and it would split the lava wave in two when it hit. Escaping from the village wasn't an option, and Sokka knew that they couldn't get to the sea in time, because this village was deep in the mountains. Instead, what they had to do was resist and fight. But Arn alone wasn't able to stop all of the lava, and half of the village and a couple of earthbenders die as debris slides down the mountain as they are pushed by the molten rock. Sokka observed this calmly, the screams of the men not bothering him, nor was the smell of melted off flesh. The others were shocked and terrified. Keep your mind on the task to be done if you don't want to die. He once again made sure to say something to keep the people's mind away from what kind of painful death they could have. This time he wasn't addressing just the villagers but Arn and Katara too. On the original timeline, the villagers had been prepared so they had been able to somewhat stop anyone from dying. That was due to Arn and Katara manipulating the clouds and making Aunt we look at them again. But Sokka knew that was just a temporary solution. By the end of the episode, people still had trusted Aunt Wu's predictions. So what about when the next volcano came? Would Arn be there each time to save them? Sokka had made the decision, he will save people his way. Tolerating stupidity was the last thing he would want to do. If he was going to bother saving someone, then he would do it the right way. Saving them and then letting them die by their naivety again, would trump his efforts and make it useless. So even as the hot air licked his dry skin, 
he never faltered even once. Knowing that if he decided to do something, he will see it to the end. For a whole hour, Arm continued cooling off the lava around the village. With Katara helping him, and Sokka protecting Katara, cutting anything dangerous that fame within her vicinity. The Earthbenders followed Sokka's orders religiously, and were able to make a huge contribution to their efforts too. By now everyone was tired, and the heat was dehydrating everyone else except Sokka who seemed okay. Though Katara noticed that his movements were slower than usual. He is getting tired too. She thought, we can't hold on much longer. Suddenly, a bubble rose amongst the lava, and the molten rock splattered towards Arn. He was too distracted and tired to notice it. Arn, look out! Katara yelled at him, and even though the avatar turned around, it was too late. Boom, that was when a torrent of water burst through the lava, forming a dome of ice around Arn, and taking the molten rock head on. Thanks, Katara, Arn thanked her. I didn't know you could do that. I can't, muttered Katara, pointing towards a further spot of the walls. There stood a familiar, silver-haired man with three red lions on his face and blue armor. They knew him, he was Toborama. The man that had stopped them from unknowingly destroying a village in the past due to jet tricking them. Katara was shocked. How was he able to pull out water from under the lava? Was he someone strong enough to pull up water from the deep underground rivers? Even she knew that was something absurd. He melodically raises his hands, and the frozen water turns back into liquid. Katara is entranced by the feat of waterbending that was happening in front of her. It was nothing short of amazing. This was no normal man waterbending, but it seemed more like the Avatar. Though Katara hadn't met other waterbenders, she instinctively knew that this man was one of the strongest out there. Waterbending isn't all about power, young girl. Fighting against strong enemies doesn't necessarily have to be a head-on fight, said Toborama, looking at Katara. He took a deep breath and controlled a huge wave of water. He used the water to cool off the lava repeatedly, slowly but surely creating a wall of obsidian, using the volcano's power against itself. At least this time you are saving a village instead of destroying it. Katara kept staring in amazement. This was like something she had never seen before. Even from such a simple display, she could tell that it was something she might never be able to do. Slowly he created a triangular shape with a sharp tip in front of the village that split the lava in two, making it go around the village. Something that they had been struggling for hours, had been handled by the man in minutes. Initially, Katara had thought that waterbending in here would be useless as the lava was too hot, it would only evaporate the water. The man looked at the villagers, and his eyes seemed to light up with joy. Katara wanted to ask Toborama to teach her waterbending, but she felt inadequate in herself. She wanted to thank him at least, but as she looked up she only saw a slow mist spreading from the place where he had been. Ash soccer POV. I stealthily moved alongside the wall and used the mist to hide my movements. Going to my water clone, that was slower than the real me. But many should just attribute that to me getting tired. Dismissing it, I was behind my sister, back into my normal form I put a hand on her shoulder. Hey Katara, stop looking with starry eyes at a weird looking person who creepily disappears after doing something. She came to her senses and muttered, a great waterbender and warrior. I guess I am never telling her who he really was. Also, I doubt she would be impressed if she knew that I had just put water barrels slightly below ground. So the feat of waterbending that I did wasn't as amazing as it seemed. On top of it all, even that was tiring as hell, just pulling such huge amounts of water and moving it around wasn't easy. I went toward Arn and made sure that he was okay. Are you hurt anywhere? No, he said, but a smile slowly came to his face as he glanced at the structure made of obsidian. But that guy is an amazing waterbender. I wish we could have had him as our waterbending master. Sorry Arn. But that was just the illusion of greatness. Not anything special. So, it seems like Aunt Wu was wrong. Wonder how the villagers will treat her from now on. Arn seemed worried. Some families had lost everything, and would try to find someone to blame. That person would most likely be Aunt Wu. Arn jumps down, and lands in the middle of the platform the villagers were on. They were already looking at Aunt Wu with hatred in their eyes. It's because of you that we almost died. I lost my home. My husband died. The villagers yelled at her in anger. Aunt Wu looked at the ground, unsure of anything. As expected, she too believed in her fate reading. I think everyone should try and calm down, I intervened. Aunt Wu wouldn't want the village to be destroyed either. She just made a mistake. It seems like Aunt got better with words. But still, he needed to be more convincing. Though the people weren't going to rip apart Aunt Wu right in front of one of their saviors. As soon as we are gone, she will be in deep trouble. I let Aunt handle this one. Aunt Wu would have to leave the village and retire. But she already had enough funds to live a good life. Her house wasn't burned either. Her assistant would have to go with her too because once Aunt Wu was gone, the villagers' hatred would go for the little girl. She had said that the village wouldn't be destroyed, but half of it had crumbled down. There was no excuse for her predictions now. Aunt Wu must be feeling deeply regretful too. Because if her readings she believed in were wrong all along, then each time she had said something in the past, it had put a person in danger. Well, this was what I had wanted from the beginning. Now people won't rely on fate and will check next time each year if the volcano was about to erupt. In the end everything ended as I had wanted. Aunt Wu retired and took her assistant with her. I didn't care if fate reading was done normally. Because when people don't believe it to such an extreme effect, 
then it wouldn't have been harmful. While our map is back, we set off, and I looked at the village as we left it. Has this been the right decision? Such thoughts did cross my mind, but it was useless to think about them now. Maybe Art Wu could have lived and kept reading others' fates, and nothing would have happened. But, I was confident that I made the right decision with the information I had at the time. That's the best anyone could hope for. Azala stood on the balcony of the highest castle in Amashu. Now that the dominating Earth Kingdom city had been captured, it was only a matter of time until the rest of the Earth Kingdom followed along. Though time wasn't on their side exactly, because the longer they waited the worse it would be, as the Avatar might master the four elements. While Amashu's king was a warrior and strategist, the kind of Ba Sing Si hadn't been seen in any war, nor even seen at all. You know, brooding here alone isn't your style, a voice came from next to her. She almost shot him with lightning but stopped herself. Recognizing that it was Kuzan, she glanced at him pointedly. You shouldn't sneak on me so suddenly. He only smiled mischievously. That look said as he was bound to do it again. You seem angry. Azala doesn't elaborate on that, because it had been almost a week since Kuzan was here, and only now she realized just how boring it was without him around. She wanted to ask him where he was, but Azala felt as if she would express weakness, and worry if she asked him. So instead, she went for the cruder approach. Next time he left, she would stick some spies on him. I was taking care of my little sister, but he answered without pause. They both knew that this would expose his weakness to Azala, but he did so without worry, as if he trusted her already. This almost made the princess smile, feeling that she was now the one in control. She is a little sickly. One day I might take you with me and we could visit her. Though I know that the chances of her liking you are slim to none, so be prepared for that. It seems like your sister is weak and already at death's door. Why do you even bother spending time with her? Azala asked him a ruthless, but a curious question. To her, it seemed like Kuzan was like her, a ruthless man. But maybe she had been wrong to make that assumption. Still, she insulted his sister in a roundabout way so he would get angry. But unsurprisingly, Kuzan only chuckled. As always, he had a terrifying handle on his emotions. Just like Ty Lee had told her, it would be almost impossible for him to become angry, and that was something Azala believed in too. While my sister might be weak, she is still my sister, her blood runs through my veins. As an older brother, I must take care of her until she spreads her wings, explained Kuzan as Azala turned around and started walking away. He followed along. As they went out, the guards in the hallway were surprised to see another man, wearing Earth Kingdom clothes next to the princess. So they got in position to fight. But with a gesture from Azala, they stopped. Now that she thought about it, Kuzan had been able to go through the whole castle with Earth Kingdom clothing. By the reaction of the guards, they didn't see him when he came in. This made her quite intrigued. It seemed like Kuzan still held many secrets from her, and one of them was his assassin-like stealth. Suspicions started bubbling up within her that Kuzan wasn't just a simple spy. As they walked through the hallways, they encountered Mai and Ty Lee. The cold-looking girl was the one who stared at him and narrowed her eyes. Just like Ty Lee had told her, if one looked closely, then the atmosphere around Kuzan was truly strange. Or at least that was what she liked to think. Because as he smiled at them, he seemed like your everyday, normal teenager. Yo, I am Kuzan. What's your name? He casually asked Mai, offering her his hand. But she didn't return the handshake and just looked at him and answered with a simple Mai. Our realization drew in his eyes. So you are one of those emo kids? Emo. Mai frowned. That sounds like an insult. Him not answering was an answer in and of itself. Azala on the other hand saw this and calmly intervened. Mai, don't let him get under your skin. He is just trying to get a rise from you. In response to the accusations, Kuzan just chuckled nervously and scratched the back of his head. Ty Lee pouted and looked away. I was planning to give you a hug, but now no more. He chuckled and went ahead, hugging Ty Lee anyway. Sorry about that. I just wanted to see what the new member of our group was capable of. You meanie, we have been a group since we were young. You are the newest member, not my. Ty Lee just pouted as she returned the hug, but smiled mischievously, planning to give Kuzan a little scare by Kai blocking him. Azala looked on in amusement. She too wanted to see him in a powerless position. But it was for naught as he grabbed her hand, just a hair's length away from hitting him. Hum, are you trying to poke me? Why did that feel so dangerous? Ty Lee looked at him in surprise. No one before had been able to react to her Kai blocking, especially if they only saw it for the first time. Still, she smashed her head on his chest as hard as she could. Those monstrous instincts are not fair. Ash, Ezela, POV. How ridiculous even though it was just simple banter. With how they are acting, it seemed as if Kuzan had been part of our group from the beginning. He was charismatic. Good at sneaking around, gathering information, and now even sensing danger. All of that pointed towards him being a top-rate assassin, a talented one too. I don't know what he is thinking most of the time, but judging by his actions, I can tell that he was trained to be an assassin probably from a very young age. Getting those kinds of skills wasn't normal otherwise, and at most Kuzan was 18 or 19. Yet he was as good as a normally talented assassin, that trained for more than 3 or 4 decades. It wouldn't be outlandish to think that he was the best assassin in the world. Normally I would be suspicious of such a man, but he hasn't been hiding it from me either. He trusted my intelligence to figure out what he was without even saying so. Well, anyone would have figured it out if he sneaked on them like that. If he tried assassinating me, would I be able to resist? 
That was a question that I needed an answer to. But still, for now, I had to let this go. There were more important things that were happening. And Kuzan was someone that I needed now more than ever. Father had given the order for the Northern Water Tribe to be captured. Initially, the plan had been to have the Avatar captured and hold him there. Now the plan had changed to killing him. But if the Avatar died, then it would just reincarnate again. The next cycle after air was water, and the war had already drained the Fire Nation out of a lot of resources. Though no one knew it yet, the Hundred Year War had wasted quite a lot of our wealth. We have been in a losing deficit for quite a while now. Also increasing taxes wasn't something we could do so recklessly either, because if anyone noticed that the royal family was getting weaker, they would be like bloodhounds. War was a complicated thing. It wasn't just who had the strongest army, but our expenditure was very big too, as we had to move troops, supplies, and everything else from the Fire Nation and into the Earth Kingdom. It isn't rare for those supplies to go missing either due to raiders. Fighting a war on enemy soil, that was on the other side of the sea, wasn't easy. If we can't take over the Northern Water Tribe, then I am afraid we will be put in a precarious situation. I had to take it over, no matter what. Sokka spent a couple of days as Kuzan, and quickly became closer to the girls. Even Mai entirely came to accept him as part of the crew. Like always, even now they were having fun playing chess, a game that Kuzan introduced them to. Pai Shou was a game that Kuzan seemed to excel too. But Azula was able to beat him at it, more than he could beat her. The game called chess was also fun. But in this one, Sokka seemed to dominate and never could get beaten. Not even by Azula. And she was the one most entranced by the game, due to the titles of the pieces, and how she could imagine real strategic battles with them. Azula and Kuzan were playing their tenth game of chess for the day, while Tai Lee and Mai placed their bets. The latter had placed her bets on Azula, believing in her friend's intelligence and natural talent, overcoming the barrier of in-game experience eventually. The room they were in belonged to Mai, it was her bedroom. Tai Lee laid on her bed and stretched. Hum, so what has been happening around here? I traveled around a little and didn't see any signs of battle in the city. Honestly, there were no people either. Because there was no fight, no soldiers and almost no citizens when we came to take the city, clarified Mai. It was only the crazy kind, and some people playing Pai Show in the middle of the street. Tai Lee looked surprised at that, everyone knew that Amashu had a strong army. So why did they leave now? They could have held up for at least a year or more. King Bumi was known as a military genius too. So some were afraid that he might have been able to repel and destroy the forces. But with how things seemed to go, most think that he seemed to have gone mad. Azula frowned as she could see that Kuzan was about to beat her. But she relaxed and tried to think of a way to win. Slowly a plan started forming in her mind, and she asked. Kuzan, what do you think about it? The way that King Bumi reacted to all of this. She had expected him to be baffled like everyone else. But instead, he only smiled. He has a good plan. One that even if everyone else knew, they wouldn't be able to stop. For an information specialist, a spy, you really like keeping secrets from me. Now she was a little intrigued as it appeared that Kuzan knew something that she didn't. It just made her even more excited. This game of cat and mouse, she loved every moment as she slowly got to pick Kuzan's mind apart. Azula knew that he had probably noticed this by now, but he didn't seem to mind it, and even played along. Sheesh, just kiss already. Mai muttered under her breath. Though she did so quietly, and only Tai Lee could hear her. Turning around, the circus girl stared at Mai curiously. Mai then got closer and whispered to Tai Lee. Can't you see just how she looks at him? Those intense eyes. Yeah, but would you call that love? Well, she either likes him or wants to burn him alive. Maybe both. Mai admitted as Azula wasn't someone easy to read, and she didn't have a long track record of being someone filled with love. So the chances she wanted to kill Kuzan were quite high too. After a while, Sokka finished playing with Azula, and the girls went to do their duties. While he went to do his, while walking around, he felt as if someone was following him. Still, he acted casual. Since Azula had given him free reign, no one, not even the governor of Amashu, who was Mai's father, would be able to stop him from going anywhere. Sokka suspected that it was either Azula or Mai's father. That sent someone to keep an eye on him. His suspensions were mostly on Azula. She was the controlling one who liked to know everything. Still, he acted like he didn't notice. And as he walked past a turn, suddenly, out of the darkness of the tunnels, the spy appeared. He walked confidently past the corner Sokka had walked. He was one of the best trackers in the Fire Nation, and believed in his abilities. There was no way a Greenhorn who seemed to still be a teen, would be able to notice him. But around the corner, he was met with Sokka's palm as he grabbed the man's face. His fingers were like steel talons as they dug in. Azula should stop hiring such second-rate spies. They suck at their job. As he said that, he punched the man in the liver and let him go. The man gasped for air as he fell to his knees. When getting punched in the liver, the body's reaction is too shut down due to shock. Even if you want to get up, you won't be able to. Sokka explained as with a fast, phantom-like kick, he hit the man's chin instantly the spy fell unconscious. When hitting the chin, the head moves too rapidly and out of control, causing the brain to hit the inside of your skull. Sometimes that could cause swelling in the brain, and that could be dangerous. But from my speed and power, 
it might even cause bleeding inside the brain. That is almost guaranteed to leave you paralyzed. Sokka remembered the story of a talented young boxer who ended up this way, due to some illegal punches to the back of the head. That was quite a sad story, but one where he had learned a lot from. If someone is willing to punch you, do your best to crush them completely. No, kill them if you have the chance. In this world it was easier to kill. War made such actions easier. He wasn't the kind of person that would spare someone who showed their fangs at him. The spy didn't exactly want to hurt him. But that was also why he gave the man a chance. He might survive, or he might not. These kinds of people were also easier to kill, as they had no families, and weren't exactly nice people either. By now to become such a high-leveled spy, that someone like Azula was willing to use him, then he must have done some unthinkable stuff to earn this honorable position. Sokka wasn't a killer at heart and didn't like killing in general. But if it came down to it, he would eliminate anyone in his way without hesitation. As he walked down towards the cells, no guards stopped him as he went to the deepest parts of the ground in a thick metallic vault. Within there was Bumi, with a knowing smile on his face. Even though he was entrapped in a metallic coffin, he seemed unbothered by the situation. What took you so long? Sokka smiled. Sometimes people can get in the way of things. Anyway, tell me where the army is. Huh? The hell are you talking about, brat? I am just an old man whose people abandoned him because they thought he was crazy. Yumi laughed with his iconic snort. Sokka sighed, running a hand through his face, cancelling the illusion around himself. Yumi's eyes widened when he saw it. This was unbelievable. A legendary assassin skill like face changing has appeared here, Sokka smirked. You groomed me to be your general leading this war. So now I need an army. For the first time in many years, Yumi was surprised by what he saw. Yumi sizzled in excitement, normally he could predict most situations. That was due to his experience and long life. There hadn't been a lot of situations that he hadn't seen by now. But this was a first, a young man from the Southern Water Tribe, who also knew a faster switching ability. It seemed to be at a high level too. Since he didn't need to create fake skin, Sokka on the other hand was calm, his body stood straight and motionless like always. His breathing cycle didn't change either. There was no sign of panic or nervousness from him. This showed his skills at hiding his emotions, and Bumi couldn't help but think that Sokka was an even better candidate than he initially thought. Where did you learn something like that from? Inquired Bumi, cackling after the question, as if he had heard the funniest thing. Here and there, Sokka waved his hand. There is not a lot to do in the Southern Water Tribe, but learn skills and boringly train them repetitively. Oh, that's a very vague explanation. It felt like you explained something. But in actuality, you didn't explain anything. Bumi explained what he had done in key detail. He had seen straight through soccer but knowing that the young man wouldn't say anything anymore either way, he decided to change the subject. How did you get down here? Sokka pointed at his face as if to say that he already showed how. Through the mask. Yumi on the other hand didn't feel any frustration at this, and only excitement. At his old age, there was something he couldn't piece together. The sense of mystery made it even more exciting. My army never moved and is there where the sun doesn't shine, Yumi muttered. His gaze filled with unusual glee. Last time we met, you were passable and good, though a little violent. Now you are impressive. Calm and collected. I have never seen someone change as fast as you. Sokka didn't say anything about that. He had his weaknesses, like everyone else. His emotions could run rampant to sometimes. With the gamer interface, if he hadn't grown at least this much, then he would consider himself useless. But he won't change Bumi's perception of him. It wasn't like the gamer interface was something he ever planned to reveal. Still, where the sun doesn't shine, the army hasn't moved. While to others that might seem like a hard riddle to someone like Sokka who previously had access to the internet, he might not be some riddle-solving genius. But he would easily guess that the people and army now were underground of Amashu. With that in mind, Sokka started walking away. Then he stopped as he was about to walk outside and turned around. Please survive until the end of the war, Aung would be quite devastated if you died. After saying that, Sokka walked off closing the heavy steel door behind him. Azala was on Mai's bed with Tai Li and Mai. As they lay down there, many thoughts went through the princess's mind. Hey, Mai, you used to like Zuko, right? Azala suddenly asked out of nowhere, surprising her friends. Mai stayed quiet about that causing their friends to take it as a sign of confirmation. But Azala didn't mind. So, what do you do when you like someone, or want to date them? Kaya Tai Li jumped up in joy, she couldn't believe what she was hearing and immediately went to hug Azula. The princess grabbed onto Mai and dragged her. If I'm suffering her either way, doing so alone would be troublesome. Azula then threw Tai Li as if she was a cat, and she landed on Mai, which caused the circus girl to hug her deeply. Suddenly the door to their room opened. Azula was ready to burn off the face of the guard who did it, but it was Sokka. He just stood there, and due to playing around the girls were intertwined with each other and their clothes rippled. Sokka blinked once, twice, and slowly closed the door. Sorry for interrupting you. Never thought you three had that kind of relationship. Wait, no. Azala yelled out panicky. She didn't want Sokka to think that she liked girls. This isn't what you think. Yeah. I was just hugging Azala, and then she threw me at my, Tai Li innocently stated with a smile on her face. But Sokka seemed unconvinced and looked at the girls. Don't worry. I don't discriminate against this kind of thing and won't tell anyone. Ash Ezela POV this is embarrassing I could see it in his slouched eyes. He suspects me of being into girls. Damn it. 
I wanted to get him to like me. After all, since I would have to be married anyway, sooner or later, I would choose Kuzan as my husband. He was skilled enough and also smart enough to stand by my side. But having him suspicious if I like boys or girls will make the situation harder. In the end, this was a battle of smarts. And even if I said that I didn't like girls that way, Kuzan wasn't someone who was convinced with just words. So then it must be with actions. How do you prove that you don't like someone? Hit Tai Lee. No, that would be too forceful, and someone like him would see right through it. So how can I convince him? The method must be quick, ruthless, and convincing. I mustn't falter in this and show true decisiveness. Kuzan kept looking and slightly walking back, so I was within a time limit. So, without thinking too much, I grabbed Tai Lee by the back of her head and kissed her on the lips. While my eyes stayed glued to Kuzan, now this would show him that even though I was kissing Tai Lee, it didn't mean that I liked it. Wait, this might have been a bad decision. Suddenly I felt Tai Lee start touching my breast and use some tongue in our kiss. Oi, 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 aren't you taking this too far? Stop. I pushed her away and both Kuzan and Mai looked at us as if they had seen a mythical creature. Turning towards Kuzan, I saw him close the door and walk away. I made the situation worse. Ash soccer POV well. That was something. Also, Tai Lee didn't seem to mind it too much either. This was a war and I wasn't here to question anyone. But damn, did I change so much of the timeline? Did Tai Lee and Azala develop feelings for each other? Damn, now at best I can hope to be a good friend for Azala. The plan was to have her fall for me and use that as leverage for her to change sides. Well, the show never explicitly showed how Azala felt about the opposite gender. She might be in a Korra like situation where she ends up with Tai Lee. Well, anyway, this wasn't that important. Soon I must go to the spirit world and try to get some things that would be useful. Currently, the dimensional chat members are all offline. It was normal for Vali, as by now he probably had a lot going on with his life. But Zabuza was different, he probably wanted to see how we could exchange jutsu between each other. He should have been the first one to try and contact me. Well, I will try talking to him later. Right now, I need to go to the spirit world and try to get something from that place. Now, I just needed to put some thoughts in Azala's mind and make her think that I was perfect for spying missions. That's so I could be away without raising any suspicions. Leaving a water clone with Azala wasn't a good idea, because the little minx was smart enough to notice something strange. How, how should I play this? And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.